Good morning, everyone. Please be seated. We are going to begin the session. We're slightly behind schedule, which we don't like, as I said several times. So this morning's session is about ethical issues in conservation. And um, you're all aware that there's a lot to discuss on these topics, uh, which are extremely important and very often uh, under-discussed. Uh, so the session is organized by uh, Rémi Beau, who is uh, with me, and Virginie Maris. Um, we're going to proceed as usual. Uh, we, Please send your questions via the chat. Remy is going to take them. Uh, you will always be able to ask them in person and raise your hand during the round table, but it does help us organize the discussion better uh, to have them slightly in advance. So thank you for that. We have um, two keynotes uh, to start the day, but before uh, Remy is going to say a few words about uh, the session and uh, how it has been conceived. Maybe you can just go to the... Okay, so welcome to the fourth session of the conference devoted to ethical issues in conservation. Uh, as we've seen in the first session, uh, nature conservation raises many different ethical issues, whether they are related to evolutionary processes, uh, to the way of sharing the earth um, with all the life forms, uh, or to adaptation to climate change, uh, topics that have been addressed um, in the previous sessions. And as uh, Francois Sarrazin said uh, in the introduction to the first session, we could have inserted ethical point of view uh, in each session and probably uh, have an interesting discussion among the panelists. Uh, we'll not address all these issues uh, here. Our choice was to take uh, an angle on what appears to be a huge challenge for conservation that could be summarized in a few words, uh, which are how to build conservation programs that are socially just and ecologically efficient. Uh, in other words, how can we work for both nature conservation and environmental justice. As we mentioned in the session presentation, it has been at least 30 years since biodiversity conservation declared its intention to shift from nature preservation to what we call more people-friendly approaches. However, the concrete effects of this goal for local people still seem to be too often absent. To put it more explicitly, uh, it is one thing to reconcile economic developments with biodiversity conservation, and it's another thing to work for social justice and the defense of the non-human part of the world. This has been convincingly argued by the environmental justice movement, which has developed strong critiques of conservation policies. At the same time, uh, nature conservation faces hostile economic and political forces that threaten its main achievements. These two trends underscore the need to rethink how justice is operationalized in conservation, and in that sense, we ask two questions in our call. How do different conceptualization of justice and equity influence conservation governance, and to what extent and through what mechanism does the integration of social objectives into conservation governance influence conservation efficiency? Our speaker will help us this morning to specify these two questions, bringing theoretical and practical materials and opting, opening several lines of discussion. Uh, namely, and first, what does it mean to talk about justice in conservation? Is it justice for only humans or also non-humans and if so, which non-humans? Uh, on this point, Ricardo Rodzi's lecture will provide important elements. Then the question is not only justice for whom, but also what kind of justice? Uh, 
What kind of justice are we talking about? Is it distributive justice, a means of uh, distributing the environmental burdens and benefits, or is it also participative justice? as the environmental justice movement tends to promote, i.e. having a voice in shaping environmental issues and environmental governance. And Tanya Brody-Rudolph's second lecture will address this topic by placing it in the complex context of the Anthropocene. We'll then have a series of talks that will present research and experiences from different fields and countries. The first two by Hildiz Omerudi, Thomas, and Chloe Gerbois will deal with the question of how to contribute as a researcher to the development of conservation programs that are more respectful of indigenous people and indigenous knowledge, and will then have two contributions focused on French territories uh, by Valérie Deldrève and Raphael Matevey, in which social justice issues are deeply linked to biodiversity conservation programs. And finally, as you are now accustomed to, we'll have a round table with other speakers, plus Jean Jalbert, who will have his view and reflection from his field experience in La Tour du Bar. So let's begin. I wish you all a good session, and if the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Is uh, Ricardo Rozzi ready? Um, floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Remy and Virginie, for the invitation. And really, the title should be A Biocultural Ethic to Overcome Chauvinisms in Plural uh, in Conservation. And I changed this uh, during these days. And so I will address several of these, um, and I will go relatively fast. So. I will focus on one approach, is how to transit from biocultural homogenization, that is the exclusion of most of biological and cultural diversity and their interrelationship, and to transit toward biocultural conservation. That's the aim. And toward that aim, these chauvinisms or gaps include the inclusion and evaluation of most of biological and cultural diversity, not only in sciences, but also in humanities, policy, and ethics, and culture in general. Uh, knowledge gaps regarding disciplines, particularly will focus on philosophy, but vernacular forms of knowledge in socio-ecological research. Geographical gaps that are still very important to understand the whole picture of the planet. And then a theory that was pointed by some speakers yesterday in particular, the gap between theory and praxis. One thing is to publish, the other thing is to actually implement these things. So I hope I can address them relatively in this short time. So chauvinism and taxonomy, I will start with biases. David Hume is one of the founders, philosophers of modern philosophy, but also modern science. And in his complete work, when he talks about animals, 97% of all of his examples are vertebrates. We know today that 97% of animals are invertebrates. So it's the opposite, the mirror image. Then we have a blind point. Not only vertebrates, but almost exclusively mammals, and amazingly, within mammals, almost only horses. <laughs> Hume was really <laughs> into this British attachment to horses. So the point here is that from the very beginning, there is a bias and there is a blind spot. The story is more complex because Hume gives foundations for a broader appreciation, but I want to leave this as the mindsets. Is this only sciences by no, uh, philosophy by no mean? And Sir Robert May and Allard Clark published at the beginning of the 2000s uh, this article calling attention to taxonomic biases in conservation, saying that 79% of all the articles um, um, 
69% of all the articles are vertebrates, while we know that invertebrates are the most diverse organisms. So here, this blind spot explains a term that for me is very accurate to the current situation. Better than the Anthropocene, I prefer this term of Necrocene. And the Necrocene was a coined by Justin McBrien, a young environmental historian, and refers to an era of death, but an invisible death. When the forest burns, we know about the koalas, we know about the kangaroos, or in Amazonia, the parrots, the monkeys, but rarely we think about the nematodes, the bugs, the little living beings. And so we need to reorient this necrosen toward a biosen, how to transit from an era of death to an era of life. And here we need to understand the changes from biases to chauvinism. And there is a difference. Well, I am in the right country. <laughs> Chauvinism refers, as you know better than I, to Nicolas Chauvin. And it's interesting that this uh, theater of variety by Theodore and Hippolyte Cognard kind of ridiculed Nicolas Chauvin, this French soldier that idolized Napoleon even when the empire was gone. So this idea of superiority. And I work in Texas, I live in Texas, and last year and this year we have been shocked by an episode that has a name coincidence. Uh, Derek Chauvin, a former police officer, was convicted this year uh, for the murder of George Floyd. One thing that I want to point out here, the initial statement by the police of the incident was, the man dies in the hospital after a medical incident during the police interaction. It adds that Floyd physically resisted the officer and the report did not mention the prolonged restraint. So this would have stayed as such if it would not have been by a teenager. And Daniela Frazier captured George Floyd's death with a cell phone and it was this video that triggered the whole process of the trial. So this is a crime. It's not a bias. And I want to call attention here because we know about the sentience capacities, not only of vertebrates, of invertebrates. We know about the values of nature. We know about the cultural diversity. And if we continue this, negating, obscuring the information at yesterday, one of the speakers said, this is a crime. It's a, master, it's a matter of justice, as Remy pointed out at the beginning of the session. That is the difference between biases and chauvinism. And the term chauvinism, from the very beginning, when it was coined by Richard Rowley, an environmental philosopher Australian who was married at the beginning to Val Pamwood, an eco-feminist philosopher, uh, was related between human chauvinism and racism. And we underestimate the, the similarities between the discriminator and the discriminated. And Tom Rieger, who had this influential book and school of thought about animal rights, appealed to this inability to recognize members of other groups as having the attributes we have. However, he focused on rational capacities, and he stays focused only on mammals. So it's a mammalocentric animal ethics. And then Peter Singer, who wrote another influential book, Animal Liberation, he promised there a liberation movement to end the prejudices of discrimination based on arbitrary characteristics such as race, sex, or species, no? However, he, when he asked about oysters, singers claim that liberation is confined to vertebrates. So to overcome human chauvinism, Singer 
appeal to sentient capacities and ascribe that exclusively or mainly to vertebrates. He has changed a little bit his position right now. But the point I want to make in this first graph is first, Prevailing ethics are insufficient to overcome current chauvinism, and I will refer to other three chauvinisms very quickly. Now, to value and respect the majority of human and other than human beings with whom we co-inhabit this planet, it is necessary to forge new ethics of solidarity, and I'm happy that Raphael Matthews will be with us today because he has done the ecological solidarity concept. But I will consider a proposal that I call the biocultural ethics. That's the second part. So how to address this? It is not by chance that ethics and philosophy has been suppressed during the Great Acceleration. We have talked a lot about the Great Acceleration. But we have not mentioned so much that there is a grand narrative of economic progress that has resulted in processes of biocultural homogenization and suppression of vernacular knowledges and practices and values that is written in a script. And this document uh, is illustrative of that script that happens after World War II. Uh, is, for example, the affairs measures of, for the economic development of underdeveloped countries, a term that was coined in the early 50s. It didn't exist before. It says, rapid economic progress is impossible without painful adjustments. Ancient philosophy has to be scrapped. All social institutions have to disintegrate. Bonds of case, creed, and race have to burst. And large numbers of persons who cannot keep up with progress have to have their expectation of a comfortable life frustrated. Very few communities are willing to pay the full price of economic progress. That was good faith. Some people really thought that this was the good world, but there was also ideology and self-interest in this agenda. My point is that this is a structural problem. So the great acceleration has this structural problem that we have to tackle. And so, this narrative is behind the conversion of mangroves to shrimp pools that was addressed yesterday in one of the talks. It's also in monocultures of conversion of native forests, such as in South and South America, into eucalyptus monocultures, that you see the suppression of biological diversity and the exclusion of people that cannot enter there, that sign that says private property, don't enter. When you have that land grabbing, that transformation of the land, you have this strong rural urban migration that has characterized also the great acceleration. And so when they become urban inhabitants, they lost contact with most of the regional and local biological and cultural diversity. The displaced populations are in real needs and misery. And for the habitats, this is extremely important. The native habitats, the place, lost their ancestral hum human custodians. Custodians is the way that today biocultural rights are being proposed to be implemented. So that the river has custodians that they need. So it's not a romantic concept today, it's a legal concept. But what is going on is to minimize negative externalities and to displace the community to avoid conflicts. Well, that's the characterization of the problem here, a characterization and offer of a solution. And this is, in part, a heuristic lens, a way to understand the problems and to design solutions. And this seems common sense, but it was not linked through the colonial Eurocentric modern lens. It's to link the habitat as condition of possibilities for life habits and the well-being of the communities of human and other than human co-inhabitants. And I hope from this talk, if nothing is understood, at least the concept of co-inhabitant stays with you. Co-inhabitant. I introduce this term in an analogous way to companion, compañera, compañero, which has been so important in the struggles of Latin America, but has a root, pre-Christian root in Latin, which means cum Panis, share the bread, as in this table. The family is sharing the bread. If one person would eat everything, the others would starve, and that person would become obese. 
So the same with the habitat, sharing the habitat. And there you see two women in the highlands of Bolivia sharing coca leaves and potato while they harvest. And this has epistemological, ontological, and ethical implications. Briefly, epistemological. We need to really balance and ponder these biodiversity inventories to overcome the logic of the specimen that has prevailed since Durer and all modernity until today, even more with barcoding, etc., and foster more a logic of co-inhabitation where you understand them in the interactions and interdependences, both humans and other than humans. Ontological, let's take our language serious. Let's go and overcome the problem of suppression of philosophy and understand what it means to be human. When the word was coined, again, pre-human, uh, pre-Christian, -pre in Latin, it means humus, fertile soil. We are people of the fertile soil. And this is pre-Christian. Of course, it's in the Bible. It's also in the concept of Adama in Hebrew, Adan. But in our Western civilization at the beginning, we understood ourselves as people of the earth, people of the land. And this is today corroborated by biochemical sciences. With my wife, Francisca Masardo, who is here with me, we did in the 90s a study with biochemical uh, approach of a cycle of sulfur to protect an area of the indigenous people of the Mapuche and the Ministry of Health. Here in this picture, you see the mountains and pay attention to the language of the indigenous people. They call Che people, Mapu. Mapuche means people of the land. The co-inhabitants are the volcanoes, rivers, rocks. The Pehuen, they are also within the Mapuche, the Pehuenche, the people of the monkey puzzle trees, the Araucaria Araucana there. So the habitats are these patches of forests and volcanic landscapes. And the habits is the recollection of seeds for nourishment and health. And these communities are particularly healthy. How is this explained with the biogeochemical and health sciences? Well, sulfur gets all the transformations from sulfidic acid to sulfate and organic transformation to have two amino acids, the only ones that have sulfur, one of them essential. So sciences and the worldview of the indigenous people converge. Is this an exception? No. Mesoamerica, the people of the corn. And you see here a very horizontal relationship between humans and plants, even more than the depiction of Heckel of the Darwinian evolution and it. However, all what I am telling clashes with the prevailing way of relationship with biodiversity. And this is a denounce by painter, Costa Rican painter, Joaquin Rodriguez del Paso, Biodiversidad, the, the picture, the painting, speaks for itself, the, the woman, oop, um, the, the, the woman, the cockroach, both biological and cultural diversity exploit and given for cheap exploitation. So this needs to be addressed and we need to resolve the social environmental injustices that objectify, exploit, and commodify human and other than human beings, and we need to restore the appreciation for the rich biological and cultural diversity of Latin America and other regions of the world. So I return to the initial painting. This was in 1920s, 1930s in Brazil, a criticism of modernity, Tarsila do Amaral, Abo Puru, a, a word that is South American indigenous that means anthropophagia, people that eat, predate natures, and results in self-destruction. But we have also other ways to do. This is Totila Albert, a Chilean sculptor that came to France and Germany, uh, inspired by the Mapuche people, by the Chilean culture, at the same time that Por Rodan has this sculpture of the earth. And he shows a picture that is not the isolated, competitive, lonely, glutonous, 
individual, but an intercultural and intergender integration that overcomes this dialectical relationship between the conqueror and the conqueror, between the master and the slave, the masculine and the feminine, and the beauty of fertilizing biocultural reality and new ethical relations of co-inhabitation. So that is co-inhabitants. I hope that that more or less provides a picture, but co-inhabitants are possible if and only if habitats are conserved and access is conserved. And habitat can be related to the origin of the word ethics, because the ethics derives from ethos, which in the first mention that we have a record of meant barn or a den. So today, based on an ecological sciences, we can interpret it ethos as protected habitat. That means ethics, protected habitats, and requires life habits of care. Later with Aristotle, another root, etique. And etique is a verb, and is the recurrent action that Aristotle relates to the cultivation of virtues. And this is critical to regain life habits that regain consciousness of co-inhabiting with diverse cultures and other than human beings. So biocultural ethics seeks to reestablish these habitats, life habits, and co-inhabitants into relationship for, with well-being for all of them. And some applications, here we have a wetland with a snipe, the rushes, an indigenous handcrafter, the life habit of basketry, and today is ethnotourism. In Japan, we're working on Sado Island, an estuary that was eutrophied, real estate value of property declined. We introduced the life habit of restoration, reintroducing rushes, later oysters, later navigation, and today also restaurants with oysters, but also seaweeds, and real estate property raising. So here, ethos, oikos, economy, ecology, and ethics together. So, so to address the second gap, I briefly presented this systemic and contextual approach that demands conserving and restoring the violent links among co-inhabitants, life habits, and shared habitats. I will rush here because uh, we cannot, but today we cannot have only theoretical framework and I want to address that this is the picture of long-term ecological research sites around the world. You see the dots, each site are pollute, uh, kind of well spread in the Northern Hemisphere and we were missing one in the Southern Hemisphere, particularly between 40 and 60 degrees south, which is very contrasting to the Northern Hemisphere. In the Northern Hemisphere, you have mostly land, 54%, uh, while in the south is only ocean, 98%. Therefore, today, we're filling a gap and giving a whole uh, map of the world. This place was unknown until the 2000s because it was unclassified for its biodiversity. And we needed to add the insects and non-vascular plants, the tiny living beings, to understand it as a hotspot of biodiversity for the world. Then we came up with this idea, and this is the first biosphere reserve in the world created on the basis of lichens and mosses, little organisms, later to give a name to this region, not Patagonia, but subantarctic Magellanic ecoregion, and then to come with the top 10 attributes. One is no geographical equivalent. Uh, I work in Texas, don't mess it with Texas, don't mess it with the summit of the Americas. And we are working there as an island, is with high endemism, but also has the cleanest rainwater in the world and the largest reserves of waters outside Antarctica. Finally, we established the long-term ecological research network there for Sentinel, and uh, that is in place. And finally, we started the creation of a large marine park, and today, in this decade, and I want to share with you that we are implementing 250,000 square kilometers of terrestrial and marine protected areas that are one of the wilderness areas according to the criterion of Conservation International that still remains. There are still wilderness areas in, around the world. It's not of the past, and it's better to conserve than to restore. The challenge is how to do this, and we cannot do it alone. Uh, so we have now a new center facility that we will uh, inaugurate next year. 
uh, in Puerto Williams, the capital city of Cape Horn, we are connected also here to France. And in summary, I wanted to leave you with you three messages. One, ethics has the root of ethos protected habitat. Like the Cape Horn, Biosphere Reserve, and other areas in the world, in all parts of the planet, which are essential for the functioning of the biosphere, the well-being of human and other non-human co-inhabitants, and also we understand this as the need of a biocultural collaboratory. I hope to have at least announced a little bit the conceptual framework of the biocultural ethic, which complements other current proposals, resignifying ethics based on this understanding of the vital links between the life habits and habitats protected for the well-being of co-inhabitants. And finally, a call to strengthen local collaborations. We, we need to work locally, but globally at the same time, and that is absolutely essential to overcome chauvinisms and to be able to value and protect the vital links of these eight, three ages for just and sustainable futures. So I want to thank you and also leave with you an invitation to continue collaborating and work together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing your broad views with us. Um, let's just move on with um, Tanya's talk. me to be here today. My background is a little different to most of the people here. I'm a lawyer. I work in, in the environmental and marine governance space. So I'm here to talk to you today about turning points in the complex maze of just and equitable biodiversity conservation in the Anthropocene. Justice and equity the concept of justice and equity in biodiversity conservation is an incredibly complex maze of overlapping legal frameworks, social realities, and an overwhelming amount of science demonstrating alarming rates of biodiversity loss. This has given rise to concerns about equity and justice. Sure. This has given rise to concerns of equity and justice. And as a result, there's been a reorientation towards the well-being of local people. And in fact, this, the rising injustices and inequalities in conjunction with maintaining a stable and resilient planet has given rise to the concept or has been defined as the two interdependent and defining challenges of our age. As a result in response to this, the notion of just transformations towards sustainability has put equity at the very forefront of global scientific endeavors and policy, such as the IPBS, um, Future Earth, Agenda 2030, um, and the Biodiversity 2020 framework. So from a global perspective to a very personal one, recently I watched a short video film about a woman called Kakoli. She lives in Madagascar and she's an octopus fisherwoman. Recently she lost her son. And so she had to burn her house down, according to her custom. And so she fishes daily from morning until late at night to try and get money for food and to, to save money for her house. And she explains during the documentary that when she used to fish, she used to be able to catch an octopus, turn around, and there would be another one, and then another one. Now she's lucky if she finds one or two in a day. I found this really hard to watch because I live close to the great African kelp forest where the documentary My Octopus Teacher was filmed. And this documentary really shifted something for me. I had no idea that octopi were such incredibly sentient beings, that they are so miraculous. They can, they can have complex strategies. They can build relationships with humans. So I found it really hard to watch Kokoli stabbing the octopus until the black ink poured out of their bodies and pushing them onto her stick. But I also understood in that moment that she has no choice. This is how she feeds her family, on a constantly dying, empty reef. And in that moment, it became clear to me that this issue of the complexity of biodiversity 
and our very human experience of living on this earth was evident. So from a global perspective, um, I mean from a personal perspective back to a global perspective, and uh, Ricardo's already mentioned this, that there's been a shift, and, and also Remy, there's been a shift in uh, conservation approaches. But one thing is clear, biodiversity conservation is more critical now than ever before. Its restoration is costlier than conservation, and there's been a shift towards um, conservation for both the co-benefits for human and ecosystem health, as well as nature-based solutions for climate. So conservation hasn't always recognized this relationship between humanity and nature. Early, early arguments for conservation or early framings for conservation argued that conservation was um, destructive for humans because it damaged their livelihoods and their traditions. And other, other conservation approaches argued that diversity um, conservation is really important to protect non-human species from humans. But now we've shifted toward, towards a more social ecological approach, which recognizes that humans and nature are dynamically intertwined and co-evolving. And this has now shifted towards resilience and adaptability to cope with the scale and pace of environmental change. So the question arises, if we're looking at social justice and equity in biodiversity conservation, is conservation more effective if it is ecologically effective and socially just. I think it's important to think about these words because inadequate consideration of human rights and of perspectives of local people have been criticized as not being effective and has given rise to cons consequences such as biodiversity conservation not being supported and not being legitimate and therefore not being successful. The, 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 I'd like to talk a moment about the differences between words because the policy and a lot of the science also uses these words interchangeably. So equality means that everyone benefits from the same support. It doesn't necessarily give rise to equity. Equity is where everyone gets the support that they need. And justice is where the cause of the inequity is addressed and the systemic barrier is removed. There's something Ricardo spoke about earlier. So across cultures and over time, what is just and equitable varies. And at the challenge for us as scientists and as people working at the, at the science policy interface is to determine what level of variability is acceptable. Um, if we look in a globally collective normative sense, extreme levels of poverty are intolerable and, and unsustainable and not, and not um, compatible with a fair and sustainable Anthropocene. So why do we still face biodiversity loss with a conservation movement that is over 120 years old? Of course, there are other drivers, climate change, population development, overexploitation, but conservation governance itself is determined to be one of the most important factors in, in successful conservation. So if we think about conservation, it's um, con conservation governance in any form of governance, it's based in law. There's always a framework or a set of rules. And rules comprise very static and fixed systems generally, and they take time to change, but they are informed by normative considerations of equity. And equity changes over time. So equity would be expressed in principles such as transparency, non-discrimination of species, or gender, um, participation. So we need, we need both equity and rights in order to achieve a balance for biodiversity conservation. Equity, as already been mentioned by Remy, has three components. Um, recognitional equity, which recognizes the um, existence of pre-existing governance systems, and a whole bunch of things like worldviews, knowledge, traditions, ethnicity, gender, and it's important because if you have recognitional equity, the community buys into it and the conservation becomes legitimate. And there's an example in the Pembroke Hopkins Park area in northern Illinois with the world's largest intact black oak savanna. Recently, a connected corridor um, conversation was very successful because of the inclusivity of 
community views. I know we've spoken this week about the challenges of connected corridors, but I'm demonstrating, using this example to demonstrate recognition or equity. Then we get procedural equity, which is the inclusive and effective participation of, the, of people involved and the ability to influence those decisions. And this is important because if you think about, it's not necessarily sufficient to just have a place at the table. It's whether the person who has a place at the table has a voice in that community and, and, and in that group. So you sometimes need an intervention to facilitate capacity and agency of, of highly marginalized groups. And we, I have an example from our country in South Africa where we have Isla Mangaliso, which is our largest marine protected area and also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Unfortunately, the community wasn't sufficiently engaged in this process. And a lot of the, the traditional um, and historical ways of using their land and fishing was compromised by the conservation efforts and they don't support it. So it's given rise to a lot of conflict. And this is obviously more complicated because of South Africa's historical structural inequity. And then we have distributional equity, which refers to fairness in the distribution of benefits and harms to different groups across space and time. The Chilean territorial user fisheries are a good example of this, where they've achieved conservation success in remaining below total allowable catch, and where they've had social equity in distribution of benefits and harms. So if we come back to the scales that we had earlier and understanding we have, we have ethics and equity and rights. Human rights are always discussed with reference to um, human, international human rights for humans. But I think it's, it's important to think about how important this is. A human being can't enjoy their fundamental freedoms and fundamental rights, like a right to life, or a right to water, or a right to food, without a certain quality of environment in which to do so. And human rights can be an incredibly, a rights-based approach can be an incredibly powerful tool for biodiversity conservation. It can ensure an ecologically sustainable environment, it can provide inter- and intragenerational equity, and, and ensure the respect of the intrinsic value of nature. Biodiversity can support human rights by protecting critical resources or undermine it by failing to do so. Sometimes rights and biodiversity clash. For example, in protected area designations, like Ricardo mentioned, human um, settlements are often required to move involuntarily, and this can give rise to environmental destruction even, and violence. But there's a growing body of research, which is exciting, and it shows that local empowerment really impacts effective conservation. So this is crucial, and the centrality of this approach was emphasized earlier this year by Mr. David Boyd, the UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights and the Environment, where he pleaded with states to put human rights at the very center of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. He pointed out that local engagement arises in biodiversity protection um, protection of um, human rights and an alleviation of poverty. So this is really important. And I'm aware that this sounds as if this is only an anthropocentric conversation, but it's not. Convergence thinking has been dominating sustainability narratives, and Ricardo has already alluded to this, but sustainability narratives have widened to include both social and ecological justice. So the rights of nature or wild law is changing the way we will face our futures. Courts and legislatures around the world are granting rights to nature, to rivers, in India, in New Zealand, in Argentina at the moment there's a, there's a case in court about a wetland giving rights to these elements. In Canada there's a, a river with nine rights. So this has also showed how in only 10 years this has happened. 10 years. It was unimaginable before this. Ecocentric justice also has given rise to a very interesting idea called bi biospheric altruism, which I think Ricardo will relate to. And this is the acknowledgement that nature has value in and of itself, beyond that which is useful to humans. So, and, it, and it asks the question, what drives modern civilizations to forget that nature has a value in and of itself? 
This is something our ancestors knew so well. Something else our ancestors knew really well was, and, and this is now obviously being reflected in science too, is that to build resilient societies and resilient ecosystems, and it ultimately the health of the entire Earth system hinges on protecting, restoring, and conserving diversity. Diversity provides insurance for systems going through change. And, and equality gives, gives communities an opportunity to bind together and helps nations and regions develop along sustainable trajectories. And we know the bottleneck um, theory from E.O. Wilson in 2002, where he warned, in his own words, we are going to become biologically impoverished. He said that we will, if we continue on this present trend, lose half of the animals and half of the plants on Earth. And according to the best science that we have today, this is exactly where we are. So we need to move forward in a more sustainable way for biodiversity and maintain diversity. This is my last slide, but it's really important. How do we move forward? How do we address these issues in biodiversity conservation? We need to find ways to navigate this complex maze of the decisions between rights for individuals versus the rights of mankind. We need to think about the rights of nature. Are they more important than human well-being? How do we deal with intergenerational equity and the generations to come? For this, biodiversity conservation needs to adopt a relational lens, which is sensitive to the fact that the ecological and the socio-cultural are constantly co-producing each other. We've seen this with COVID. And this will lead to better understanding of human nature relationships and give us better metrics and better definitions so that we can, we can design more effective conservation initiatives. Conservation also needs to move away from blueprints of the past where we start having governance systems and initiatives that are more iterative and adaptive, that can, that can flex and bend and meet the challenges as they arise. We need to build the bridge while we walk across it. For this, we will need flexible institutions and multi-level governance. So I've already mentioned flexibility and also social learning. We need to learn from other systems um, and, and not repeat the same mistakes. We have, we have a connected world now. We need to share knowledge. We need inclusivity, and I don't mean only comprehensive stakeholder engagement, but I mean inclusivity of alternative knowledge systems. We, we need to include systems that are not our own, that we are not familiar with. And we need scientists to be more reflexive, to, to understand that the normative position that they take influences the knowledge that they create. So we need to include non-mainstream non ways of, of knowing. There are very useful tools that can be used for conservation. The IED and IUCN tools on social governance, the IUCN star metric for measuring biodiversity targets, and the key biodiversity areas approach for nuanced and targeted biodiversity interventions. And finally, really importantly for, um, for this year, Reyes and Selig point out that we need we need more effective and much more ambitious biodiversity targets and goals. But even more importantly, these targets and goals need to be linked to global targets such as the SDGs and the Biodiversity 2020 framework. Because the way the targets are framed at the moment it make it impossible to determine the impact of development goals on biodiversity. And this is a problem. These, this has to be addressed. We need to integrate conservation initiatives and think about them and integrate them into these targets so that, that, that we actually achieve what we're wanting to achieve. And there's a very good example by Sala et al. in a paper published this year um, where they looked at marine protected area frameworks and they found that by protecting only 21% of the ocean, we can get 90% of the biodiversity benefits that we want. This is significant. In Kunming, they are going to agree a target of 30% of the ocean protection by 2030. Some scientists have already shown we only need to do 21% to be effective. This is really important. It's, it's entirely doable. It's feasible. It just has to be strategic. It requires international cooperation and some flexibility. 
So embedding conservation at the heart of biodiversity research and conservation will lead us into a future that is more sustainable through deep transdisciplinary guidance. We can, our scientists need to be, have passion and imagination, and we need to fearlessly adopt new ways of thinking, being, and knowing so that we can move forward into a future which is more just, which has diversity, and which is more sustainable for all life on Earth. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you for this very inspiring talk, uh, just as was the one before. Uh, we're slightly ahead of schedule, so if anyone has a, uh, a question off the top of their head right now, we can try and address it briefly. Uh, any reactions on these talks? We're very wide. I could just ask a small question since you're a lawyer. Um, we hear very often that the legal background of, I mean, has this year, these years changed a lot uh, in a way that's favorable to conservation? You've said yourself that there have been huge changes in the last 10 years. This is not very visible uh, for the general public. And um, even sometimes you may think this is in some symbolic sphere which doesn't really matter for reality. Um, how, how do you see that particular issue? Um, it's, a, it's an interesting question because the conversation about recognizing the rights to an environment, the human rights to environment, has actually been on the table at the United Nations for 45 years. And there's, there's been conventions that have been drafted recognizing the, the rights, sorry, the rights to um, an environment. And so this has been, this actually has been on the table for very many years. But for some reason, people have been hesitant to um, engage with a full declaration of a human right to the environment, which would also then have a corollary effect of protecting nature, because then the two are interlinked, as I was demonstrating. And um, it's, it's now starting to shift. The, 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 I mean, Mr. David Boyd has put this on the table for the Biodiversity 2020 framework and asked all members of the United Nations to place this right at the center of biodiversity framework. So it's starting to shift, but I agree with you, it needs to become much more mainstream. And the rights of nature is so interesting, everyone is fascinated by it. And it would be good if we could get more of this knowledge out there. But there are over 150 constitutions in the world that do, that do protect the envir environmental right, which is good. So it does happen. People are just not as aware of it as they should be. Yes, go ahead. Thanks, Tanya, for a very inspiring talk. Regarding this question, I think it's critical to, to put it in this context and we can continue in the overall debate. But uh, one example about biocultural rights is the Atrato River that complements the examples that you gave. The Atrato River was um, assigned biocultural rights in 2017 in Colombia, mostly due to human health uh, to high levels of mercury pollution due to gold mining. And it's in the constitution of Colombia. However, the levels of mercury continue raising. So three, three thoughts about this for the general debate at the end. First, the conditions of democracy, the conditions of possibility. And when the concept of uh, democracy was coined by Aristotle in Athens as a nation state, he prevented that in order to have democracy, we need to have the capacity to sanction idiots. And idiots are very intelligent and smart people, but are self-interested and balanced. So people that don't pay taxes, people that only care about that. And the current government, the current regime of governance is a plutocracy, is not democracy. Therefore, it, cases like Colombia and other cases of rights and justice are overridden by this uh, 
problem of governance and is a matter of power that is urgently to address. Second, I would give hope also in looking at the diversity within all traditions of thoughts, all traditions of governance, including Europe. I would talk about modernities, and most people in this continent are aware of this and are willing to do this. So the idiots are a few, the wealthy are a few, but we need to address this problem of the judicial, the executive, and the economic powers together with the military powers. So that's a problem. And if we don't address that, we cannot uh, fulfill the circle. And, and finally, uh, for intercultural dialogues, I think, yes, the biocultural rights are very important and required to be implemented to have custodians, as I said. There are people that need to defend, and I hope that this conference, pre-conference and IUCN conference can help to implement that at the planetary scale. Thanks very much. So, I think Yildiz is going to talk to us about these custodians precisely uh, and their traditions. So I give her the floor with pleasure. Uh, good morning. Thanks to the audience. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, yes, after these uh, two beautiful talks, I hope I am able to bring a few ideas. And I will, as an anthropologist and uh, ethno-ecologist, uh, working mostly on the field, uh, I will bring some uh, ideas about practices and multiple values of indigenous peoples and local communities related to nature and how they find themselves today in right at the heart of biodiversity conservation issues. Um, so I just tried myself out with uh, this figure, which uh, in fact is very heuristic representation of uh, what is uh, nature and culture and, and where uh, and, and what affects different values of nature from local to global. Uh, because uh, all our experiences with uh, indigenous peoples and local communities show that they integrate fully uh, all these spheres as part of nature and culture, and it's totally intertwined, and this has been said. And um, so there's uh, nature, in fact, uh, integrates also social and material spheres in the sense that all social organization and relationships between people are devised uh, exactly according to their relationship to nature. And of course, biodiversity is part of nature, but also physical parts, such as soils, rocks, volcanoes, as well as climates, sky and clouds and, of course, a full cosmovision. And when we are talking today about uh, the relationship between IPBS and IPCC, I mean, it has been ages that uh, the indigenous peoples have totally uh, integrated these fears and we have to, to think about it. And uh, it's not totally, uh, I mean, this is a mandala, and, and it's not, I'm not a Buddhist, but uh, the, the, the frontiers of the, of the, the system, the, the borders, are totally, I mean, within the Anthropocene today, are totally being disrupted, and disrupted so quickly that what is inside now may, may fall apart. So we have to be very careful when we work with indigenous people and local communities. So what happens really on the field when we work, uh, when I've been working for eight years in the high Himalayas? <laughs> is, is that uh, one person alone, I mean, integrates uh, uh, multiple values and multiple levels in her decision making. First of all, there's this very subtle level, which is the nature, culture, and ontology, how she positions herself as an, herself to non-humans and also to other humans, which is totally a mirror in fact, how you position yourself with others, humans and non-humans are very uh, related, uh, including rocks, soils, and this is, well, in the Himalayas based on analogical and animistic principles. 
She also has a very high naturalistic knowledge. That's what we generally recognize as ecologists. And she constantly monitors biophysical processes. She forecasts weather, uh, combining with topography and types of resources she needs for yak herding. And she responds to multi-level decision making um, with multiple institutions like religions, administrative, social institutions, uh, social exchange networks, marriage, and everything. And she's in particularly place-based. Her activity is totally place-based culturally uh, with significant practices which, which constantly consider the importance of her environment. So indigenous and local knowledge integrates different nature culture spheres of knowledge and values of nature. It is intricate, multifactorial, and a complex system of knowledge linked to high ecological heterogeneity. So uh, today there's no doubt at all by the, by the uh, research community as a whole and by the indigenous people themselves that they, can, they, they are fully recognized for their roles in preserving, maintaining, nurturing, and in, in some cases inspiring and bringing about today transformative changes. And this is underway. This is an ongoing process. At 12 today, the indigenous summit of the indigenous people will start. And uh, this is very important. This map is, uh, comes from a paper that we put together very quickly during the IPBS uh, e uh, global uh, evaluation to be able to show that it is, not, it is not a little thing. I mean, this map shows that 38 million kilometers in 87 countries representing a fourth of the world's superficie, is inhabited by indigenous people. And this is in 40% of uh, protected zones or high biodiversity zones. So, so this, this has been a major argument during the, the global evaluation uh, to put forward some ideas. So there's a large set of practices that we have not finished yet to understand and to, to evaluate. But all of these have commonalities, in fact. Within diversity, there is a commonality which is, in fact, humanity, our part of humanity. So it's ecological and cultural diversity, adaptation to change based on management of high biodiversity, high level of social ecological resilience, local governance favoring commons, and yet acceleration of the rate of changes may be too high. Today, all uh, IPLCs, if I may call them like this, indigenous peoples and local communities, uh, uh, face major issues of climate change, globalization of food systems, health problems, and huge pauperization. Um, so I'll give some examples because we are from an ecology institute in Montpellier and Dolmake is in, in the room, but just to say that uh, indigenous people have the art also of shaping diversity beyond natural diversity. In fact, we all have examples, but Dol's work on the flooded plains in the tropics with the, uh, shows uh, so many different uh, ways like here, uh, in Congo, uh, people creating um, high resource mounds, huge mounds. I do have a pointer. I'm used to teach and I, well, anyway. So these mounds are created de novo with, uh, with different types of soils, with local namings, with local classifications, and therefore create new patches and new diversities in the landscape and uh, in a system which is flooded and therefore which is now well-drained soil. Uh, another example from, from our team in Montpellier is the very rich uh, tropical uh, agroforestry systems, but also the fact that this is, uh, has to be understood fully as a continuity from gathering, protecting, to cultivating. There's no stark divide between cultivation and, uh, and the wild nature. This is a safety in case of environmental risks. And this is also the junction between the intangible and the tangible part of nature. And all this has to be fully integrated if we want to understand the, the functioning of these systems. And these systems, I don't have... 
I still have time. Uh, <laughs> sorry. These systems are, are huge, uh, I mean, providers of uh, highly high-level food systems. And in relation to yesterday's talk also on health, I think we have to consider that, that it is a priority today to conserve the agrodiversity uh, of indigenous people and local communities. So, uh, when I said that uh, social organization is totally part of the, uh, this uh, natural, cultural, integrated system, you see here an example also from small islands in the Pacific where, uh, I mean, the system is not static and, and people constantly exchange and this is about this idea of the commons. I mean, crops keep on traveling, people keep on exchanging and social um, connectivities are an important asset of, uh, uh, of these type of practices. Uh, this is the place where I work. This is my, my, uh, my lab recently. It's a small island in Sicily. And uh, within uh, 83 uh, square kilometers, which uh, is of this island, you will find such a large diversity of, of knowledge about how to deal with uh, lack of water. There's no river and no, no sources on this island, yet people have been using extremely sophisticated systems such, a, such as lithic mulching with uh, pumice stones. Uh, these grape fields are, are planted in, in a sort of holes called the conca. Uh, heavy pruning of, uh, of uh, olive on, on the side shows that they are right on the ground, so, so the olive trees are, are much lower than, than us. Barley intercropping with a cereal planted with an African technique of, of planting cereals in holes rather than than uh, the usual cereal system, of course, the dry stone terracing. All of this shows the capacity to, to think together climate and biodiversity. And, and these are major examples for the future. And we, uh, there, there is an urgency to understand and, and to, to, to create linkages also between people who are able to understand that. Um, so I tried to put some ethics and justice because there are major issues, I would say hard ethical issues and justice issues, is that the indigenous people who are self-identified were recognized only since 2007 by the United Nations. They represent 6.2% of the world's population, 500 groups speaking 4,000 languages, local communities, represent a huge diversity of social cultural groups, which are more or less recognized by the CBD, IPBS, and IPCC as local communities, but they are hardly recognized. There is general definition as uh, traditional people managing a significant portion of the world's terrestrial and coastal landscapes and biodiversity. Pastoralists alone represent 500 million people and shifting cultivators, one billion people. So we've been, it took us a long time to try and understand even how many people they represented because most of them are not in the census, of course. So major drivers are well known and importantly based on a single value, which is monetary benefits, land grabbing, resource extraction, deforestation deforestation, but all these activities which threaten biodiversity are not constrained really by policies. States remain sovereign regarding biodiversity and impacts on indigenous and people, uh, indigenous people and local communities have cascading effects that have been mentioned. And we are engaged in writing a lot of papers, including indigenous peoples writing their own local biodiversity outlook with many groups that are getting together today, like the International Forum on Biodiversity, Indigenous Biodiversity Network, Centers of Distinction, uh, women's indigenous groups, and so on. So basically, yes, we need to, to speak out very quickly and alert humanity about the situation. Um, just uh, also about inequities, 8% of the global population relies on medicinal resources 
natural medicinal resources. Uh, uh, IPLCs have identified a long history, 7,000 medicinal plants, which are highly uh, under threat. And one of the main threats is that uh, we are all living in towns and that people in towns lack nature and are asking for more and more and more natural resources without ideas about how to, how to uh, use them. And the people in the source areas now have reduced access for local health purposes. Uh, the global health has a very high dependency upon indigenous and local knowledge. 25% of new drugs are based on uh, local knowledge. 70% of modern drugs to heal cancer originate from natural substances or nature mimics of natural molecules. Most of these drugs are developed by large multinational industries. Global industry in traditional medicine also represent $83 billion. And it has been estimated that the pharmaceutical industry earns $32 billion per year in profits from products derived from traditional remedies. So ethical and justice issues are huge because there's a major shift from knowledge on biodiversity based on relational values and commons reciprocities between humans and non-humans to a private system with little reciprocity between humans, this is important, and also between humans and non-humans. There is a shift from a large diversity of medical systems based on multiple values to an efficient medical system, it's true, based on privately owned knowledge and information on biodiversity dominated by monetary values. And the poorest among the poorest, the 80% of the world population, have little access to conventional medicine and suffer from over-exploitation of local medicine. On the right, I have to present to you my friend and somebody I worked with for a long time. I'm Shigyat Sobista. He's a medical doctor from Nepal. And he says, I am interested with all sentient beings and this is a measure of his high level of recipro reciprocity with non-humans. It's evident. He's working for all sentient beings. So possible synergies are still, uh, we are trying to, to develop. Co-construction of research approaches between local indigenous knowledge and researchers are uh, the only pathway for us now. Um, but it, it has some, there are some problems because uh, we are able as researchers in building mostly only on naturalistic parts of their knowledge. And, uh, but uh, experience shows, because we have been doing that, that uh, this is the part also which is common to humanity as a whole. <laughs> so they do recognize that we can share this part of their knowledge, and they have to decide which part they want to share and do not want to share, because there are aspects of knowledge that they do not want to share. Invisible parts of nature is not considered by the researchers, yet very important to them, linked to issues of consciousness of non-humans, and also recent debates in anthropology on agency of non-humans. You have uh, been discussing that. Such values uh, to be considered in multiple valuing approaches to biodiversity, and there is an undergoing assessment of IPBS on multiple value assessment. Joint projects with IPLCs for conservation and monitoring impacts of climate are feasible. We need uh, approaches which we call decolonized approach of research, which is required. IPLCs should become full research partners and research processes require new and innovative tools. And engagement of researchers to find solutions should be based on shared questions at a territorial level. So I'm almost finished. Um, among the ideas, the setting up of living labs with IPLCs to be recognized by policies at national levels and networking at regional levels, if not at global. Solutions to be discussed with all concerned stakeholders at the territorial level during the course of, of research to enhance quick uptake, because we are in a crisis, 
and transformative changes, including quick feedback to decision makers. So just to let you know, IUCN indigenous people uh, uh, members are starting their summit today. They will be proposing indigenous-led conservation agenda for the governance of indigenous lands and natural resources, creating their own platforms for participation and representation in global environmental policy spaces, which is already undergoing. Local communities are little recognized in this process with the risk of losing the strength vision of a large portion of the world population concerned. Researchers can accompany this whole process of recognition. Multiple working groups have been working, publications and events. Multiple revitalization processes are underway locally and among researchers, changes in research approaches, including art and science, which is a major way of sharing with uh, local communities, less big data, less publications, and more actions. New professions in re research are, are really needed uh, in mediation and communication, and very quickly. Thank you very much. Um, thanks very much. C can you just, uh, we have two minutes before the next speaker. Uh, Tell me, the impression one gets from the outside is that um, this has made a lot of progress in the last 10 years. I mean, the consideration of indigenous people and the self-organization of indigenous people. Um, so there is a sort of uh, race right now between environmental and uh, destruction. Uh, and this organization and this empowerment of indigenous people, uh, do you think there is reasonable hope um, that um, out of this race comes some good things? Well, we have lost a lot of time, I would say, because this started uh, almost in 1992 with the World Summit uh, in Rio and um, the declaration of Belém. And, and then um, it took a very long time for even uh, the recognition by the United Nations of, uh, and this recognition is, is not, uh, I mean, on the ground, uh, the nation states, uh, there's no particular rights, in fact, because uh, the nation states, as you know, I mean, I don't want to, in point, but Brazil, for instance, does not follow the, uh, the this issue of rights of indigenous people. So, so the, the, there's a whole issue about uh, how to apply the. I mean, what are the rights? How the CBD, for instance, uh, can constrain the 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 nation states, and how the nation states uh, should have uh, little time now to react, as otherwise they should uh, pay for that. Uh, th there is a, a huge problem about, uh, you know, but uh, the, I would say that the indigenous peoples themselves, they have reached the bottom. We have not yet, but they have reached the bottom. So they, they, they are putting a huge energy themselves to, uh, to, uh, comment dire, um, uh, to keep uh, to keep the nature going, because it's their uh, life which is at stake. So, so this this is the hope is to work with them, because uh, I wouldn't say only indigenous peoples, but uh, they are in such a situation that uh, they are pushing something uh, about transformative change, which we have to uh, to take uh, together, and uh, it's not. It's not at all easy, but uh, our research activities has to change because we cannot address such poor people uh, with too theoretical research now. We cannot wait for our publications to come out to propose uh, or discuss actions. We cannot wait for that. Uh, so <laughs> that's it. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so thank you for um, this glimpse of the treasure of the diversity of people and practices. Uh, now we move on to the talk of Chloe Gerbois, uh, and I'm hoping that she's with us. Um, until now, it has always worked.
Hello, everybody. I'm trying to share my screen now. We hear you, Chloe. Okay. Um, and the can you see my screen? There. Yep. Okay. Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'm uh, sorry I had to, a because... Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Can, can you activate your camera? Because uh, I'm the visible person right now, and I shouldn't be. Sorry. Um, yeah, I'll try to do that. I'll just share my screen. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Sorry, I had a bit of a flu in the past um, few days, so I hope I'll be able to do my talk without having to cough too much in the mic. Um, so today I'm going to um, discuss a bit about um, what we've been doing in, um, in Zimbabwe for the past um, 10 years and what we've um, learned from that experience. So just a quick outline of this presentation, I'll start by um, positioning conservation place-based research in the global context. And then I'll talk about the evolution of human nature relationship in the Wanga system. Then I'll discuss what they mean about nurturing a culture of respect for biosphere-based sustainability before um, discussing some ethical implications for conservation science and practice. So I think all the talks we've seen so far, um, there's um, a clear evidence um, that um, the main challenge we're facing today uh, is our leadership. We know what needs to happen. People have been stressing it for the past 50 years and nothing has, nothing has changed. So um, in the first session, Francois Sarrazin presented this figure, which discreetly um, stressed the importance of moral values and behaviors for biodiversity conservation. But what this paper stress as well is the importance and the contribution of indigenous peoples and local communities to biodiversity, which we've heard a lot about already. And the research I'm going to present aligns well, quite well uh, with the IPBES framework, um, but also illustrates some of the action-oriented research conducted within the uh, French long-term socio-ecological research network uh, so, um, the Wanga socio-ecological system has been labeled um, as Zone Atelier in 2011. This is uh, one of the two Zone Atelier uh, situated outside of France. Um, it's in Zimbabwe, especially in the Matabelian uh, province. Um, the ecosystems are characteristic of this traffic savanna with an average rainfall of 6,000 millimeters, which is quite dry, and a coefficient of variation of uh, 25%, and it hosts one of the highest density of elephant in the world. And several um, talks have stressed that um, often large mammals are the first to disappear when po human population increase. So I agree <laughs> with Ricardo Rodzi that uh, mammals and elephants um, might not be at the core of our conservation concern, but they would indicate it to describe human nature relationship or the state of this relationship. So the history of Wangé people, uh, of the Wangé people and their wildlife has been markedly influenced by colonialism. Um, um, and this colonialism was uh, motivated by access Chloe, to uh, non-renewable. Can, can you hear me? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry yes. to interrupt you. Can you speak a little more slowly because uh, the, the sound connection is not perfect here? So, um, uh, sorry. So, so that we really catch you. Um, okay. Thanks very much. So the, his the history of the Wonge people and wildlife has been markedly sorry? influenced by colonialism, motivated by access oh, to non-renewable... Sorry? We've lost the slides. Shem, where are you? Okay. Um, do you, you want me you to share again my screen? I'll, I'll or, start. or are you further on in the presentation? Because yeah, I'll start. I'll try slide. to share again my screen. Okay. Can you see here? Yeah, now it's moved on. Thanks. Okay, I'm sorry. You've moved the previous slides, I think, but um, you've lost it. But anyway. Um, okay, so we hear you well now. Just try and continue like that. Thanks. Okay, sorry about that. So the history of the Wangi people and wildlife has been markedly influenced by colonialism, um, motivated by access to 
non-renewable natural resources, in particular coal in this case. This resulted uh, in the development uh, of a fortress conservation approach is characterized by appetite type of land use, land tenure, and the eviction um, of uh, indigenous community. This fortress conservation approach also involved a high interventionism regarding wildlife um, and that characterized into the management paradigm in conservation. In Wangue, 85 water holes were created um, in about uh, 40 years. And this resulted in changes in ecological dynamics. Um, uh, predators were first eliminated to promote herbivore population, and then there were massive culling of herbivores, including elephants. In 1984, more than 40, uh, more than 4,000 elephants uh, were killed in this system. This neoliberal uh, model of conservation led also to the development of international tourism, a community-based natural resource program, and the privatization um, of conservation. Wangé is part of the Casa Kavango Zambezi Transfrontier Conservation Area, which is funded and trusted by Western Conservation Agency. Their mission is to sustainably manage the Okavango Zambezi ecosystem, its heritage and cultural resources, based on best conservation and tourism models for the socioeconomic well being of the communities and other stakeholders in and around the eco region through harmonization of policies, strategies, and practice. For the past 10 years, um, I worked in nine villages where, um, that were created by the apartheid regime at the periphery of two protected areas, the Wangi National Park, which I talked about, and the Sikumi Forest. Um, Wangi can be associated as uh, a full protected area in CN category one, while the Sikumi Forest um, allows some access to the community. If I started my research career as a bioeconomic uh, modeler, meeting the people of Wangi resulted in major personal transformation and brought me to embrace the complexity of conservation and consider the interactions between ecosystem processes and well-being. I particularly focus, sorry, uh, Ricardo again, uh, on the drivers of human elephant coexistence. And in this graph, um, I just wanted to stress that it is not all negative. A lot of people hear about human elephant conflict, but look at uh, people have a huge respect and um, a very uh, diversified set of values, uh, mostly embedded in their relational subsistence values um, when it comes to elephant. Then I later worked with some of my colleagues on the evolution of nature's contribution to people in the Wonga system. Here we collected life histories from 40 people on the age of Wonga National Park. We looked at nature's contributions to these people, the evolutions of nature's contribution to these people over the past 70 years from their indigenous uh, nomadic uh, community driven by biocultural uh, values, uh, some ethnic tensions and uh, deeply uh, indigenous knowledge systems deeply rooted in the biosphere. And then we, with, with the colonialism and the institutionalization of apartheid, a lot of things change for these people. Together with global change, increasing human densities and westernization, aridification, socioeconomic, political crisis, institutional collapse, resulting from the second land reform where most of the European people left the country and that resulted in an economic embargo for Zimbabwe for many years. Today, there is still a, the governance in Zimbabwe is very weak, and this system is characterized by big environmental degradation. The people of Wangi continue to depend on natural resources, even though they were resettled on very poor land. Um, thankfully, they have access to some part of the, of the Sikumi forest. Um, and, 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 and this protected area contributes a lot um, to the provision of energy. These people have no electricity, no water. They have to do on average a kilometer to access water and more than a kilometer to access firewood for cooking. And the resources they depend on are hugely stressed. And the, the protected area contributes to reduce the stress. In 2019, um, 
I was invited by colleagues from Sierra to design and coordinate um, a development project funded by the EU. This is called, this project is called Promoting Sustainable Livelihoods in Transfrontier Conservation Area. And we use Future's approach to unravel the pathways to sustainable livelihoods. So in the graph here, I present some results of this workshop. It was a five days workshop we started with, uh, where we look at driver force for sustainable livelihood as understood by knowledge brokers. So we invited many different stakeholders from traditional leaders to, to people involved um, at local government level, provincial government level, um, people from Zim parks, but mostly knowledge brokers, not, not only representative. And what came up, uh, what the, the drivers that came up were community governance, community and governance, land use regulation and allocation, the state of natural resources, the local culture, and farming systems and livestock. Then we engage at local level, at more local level, at village level. So we engage with the, the, the villagers and we work um, independently with the youth, the women, and the elders. And then we ask them to come together and to propose 10 actions um, that we could start collectively to promote a better future. And nine of them were classic interventions targeted by NGOs like the construction of boreholes, capacity building, developing local markets, community-based tourism, small remnants projects. But the one came up that really um, bothered me and, and again was a bigger shift in, 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 in my personal experience was nurture a culture of respect. Basically, those people were thinking, were saying you can develop and, and, and develop infrastructures the way you want, but if you don't nurture a culture of respect, this is going to fail. And this is, um, so now I'm going to talk about um, why, what they mean by nurturing a culture of respect. This is very far from my domain of expertise. I'm not a social scientist by training, um, but I'm, I'm a sustainability scientist and I engage a lot with people. So I'm not gonna analyze that. Culture of respect is finding means to protect, care for, nourish, support, and develop the social behaviors, customs, norms, laws, beliefs, habits, attitudes, knowledge, and perceptions that can ensure maximum moral consideration and respect for the biosphere and from all. Taboos, proverbs, poetry, music, dance, games, folk takes are used to teach love, gratitude, respect, praise, retribution and health, among other attributes that encourage the spirit of good new humanity when relating to living and non-living natural entities. Respect starts with self-identity, then appreciation of the phenomenon and the study. While indigenous knowledge systems are quite useful for the biosphere, they are threatened by a number of factors such as technology and science, globalization, global warming, modernization, religion, and forms of communication coming from the more civilized part of the world, among others. So the first point of call is education. Cultural conservation should be introduced fully in the school curriculum where learners learn the importance of culture and personal identity. So now I'm going to talk about the ethical implications, so my analysis, um, and this will obviously relate a lot with what has been said already. So there's, I'm afraid there won't be a lot of new things. Um, so the conservation dilemma is deeply rooted in the relationship with, in our relationship with and about um, the biosphere and particularly land and the natural resources. And we need to acknowledge the rights um, of other people and organism, as what was stressed this morning. The need to respect nature um, is, uh, is a universal challenge, but it's particularly challenging for Western civilization. And I would, um, yeah, I, I think, what I, what, I, what I personally learned from that experience in Zimbabwe really reflects um, what uh, Jean-Louis Martin, Virginie Maris, and Daniel Silverloff um, 
commented on their paper. So we could propose to reframe the vision of transfrontier conservation uh, area, for example, such as instead of talking about sustainably manage, we could use the word like protect and nurture the Gaza ecosystems because they are very diverse and its heritage, natural and cultural resource. For the socio-economic, maybe socio-economic is not necessary, but for the well-being of local communities and stakeholders, based on conservation and tourism, that I'm not sure, maybe we need to be a bit more creative and think about other ways to nurture and protect nature through collaborative and adaptive policies, strategies, and practices. We may need to accept that business as usual is over and to embrace the post-normal ethos. And actually the change is happening. Recently, some researchers from South Africa pointed to the need to decolonize ecology. So given the current challenges, improving our adaptive capacity should be at the core of the next leader's agenda. And as it's been stressed before, socio-ecological complex, uh, socio-ecological systems are complex adaptive systems. And therefore, if we want to navigate them and promote sustainability, we need to foster interactive learning and collaborative process, map feedbacks across scales to identify thresholds, traps, mechanisms that build or inhibit systemic agency and resilience manage for emergence and unintended consequences and foster responses that are flexible to be able to redefine our intent. Um, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation as well as um, some people in Wange, um, some of the people in Wange and, and some of my um, colleagues like Peter Zelanomalo, Zenei Dervio, Alex Caron, Herbe Fritz, who contributed to um, this um, journey and also an MU uh, for their moral and financial support. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, this presentation, Chloe. It was very interesting. Uh, please stay with us for the round table that we're going to have uh, at the end of the morning at 11.40. And in the meanwhile, I think we have deserved uh, some coffee and a break. Thank you for your attention, everyone, and see you in 20 minutes.
Thank you for being back. So we have two more talks, uh, and then we will start the roundtable. Uh, the first talk is by uh, Valérie Deldrève uh, from Bordeaux on the conflicts between conservation and equity. Um, do we have Valérie with us? We do. Every time it seems like a miracle, but... Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Uh, thank you for being there. Uh, so... We want to stay on schedule, so we're going to take your talk as soon as you're ready. Please go ahead and then uh, stay for the round table. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is it okay for you? You can, you can see um, uh, my presentation. Yeah, we see your screen. Okay, okay. So I'm very delighted to participate today. Thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, let's begin. Uh, are national parks inherently unequal? My colleague Cecilia Kles and I have formulated this somewhat provocative question on the basis of our work, which was informed by a rich literature in French environmental sociology, political ecology, and environmental justice. This issue also echoes with the recent rise of equity issues in the field of conservation research. Valérie, I'm, so, I'm sorry to interrupt you. You're not full screen. Uh, we would see your slides better if you could go plein écran. Plein écran, okay. Is it okay for you? Yeah, it's better. Um, it's better? It's still not full screen. Mm. Control L, I'm told. I am trying. Yeah. Okay, no. Hope we don't lose no. it all. Okay, it's pretty big. We can we can do with that. Oui. Um, yeah, it's not centered right now. I don't know how to do. I'm very sorry. Uh, non, ça ça va pas faire. Hein. Bon. That's better. Um, I have sent uh, this presentation, but I don't know if you can use it. I try, I'm trying something else. Um, Okay, just, just go ahead like that, Valérie. It's fine. We hear you. We see the screen. We're going to manage. Uh, sorry. That's okay. But I can't see it now. Um, okay. So, uh, my... Um, Yes, uh, I don't know why that. Uh, ah, yes, this issue also echoes with the recent rise of equity issues in the field of conservation research linked to the inclusion of equity language in major conservation policy frameworks. However, our field works show the need for equity is still ignored by the key actors, key stakeholders, involved in implementing French national park policy. They have concerns about equity, but equity is not a target in itself, 
It's not a criterion of assessment, and the principles of justice used in the park's consultation and decision-making bodies don't promote equity. Consequently, national parks tend to exacerbate environmental inequalities within the territories. We define environmental inequalities with reference to environmental justice as social inequalities in the relationships of population or social group groups to the environment. They cover inequalities in impact on the environment, as well as inequality in risk exposure, access to abilities, to ability to influence policies in favor of the environment, or to benefit from their effects. Um, so, um, how conservation and equity are in tension within national parks? How are social justice and ecological justice articulated? So, we deal with that through three topics. Who benefits from them? Who supports the environmental efforts? Who participates? Well, uh, here I'm going to speak about personal and collective research carried out from 28 uh, to 2019 on three territories classified as national parks. One is, um, one is the French overseas departments, Réunion Island, where dominate the policy of endemic conservation and the struggle against invasive alien species. The other two are located in the southwest of France, and they are therefore very close to you today. The Calanque National Park, which is both urban and marine, and the neighboring and older Porco National Park. In these two parks, the conservation aims are defined on various fronts, including the important one of regulating over-visiting. Let's, like, uh, let's look first at who benefits from these parks. And I won't talk about economic benefits here, even if um, that is an important dimension, but I will focus on visitors. Overvisiting is a public issue highlighted in Marseille Creeks or Porquerolles Island, and a new French draft of law aims to regulate this hyperfrequentation in French of natural heritage. However, if we look at various statistical studies on who mainly visit protected natural, natural area, included on a regular basis, we see that visits are above all. First, a matter of proximity, which raises issues about the effect of gentrification policy, as in Marseille, where the park is defined by local elected as an attractive showcase for new well of people. Second, it's very unequal for this, but also for many other reasons, such as the cost of using nature and the differentiated socialization. People with low income and low level of scholar education and women are statistically less likely to use protected nature as recent statistical studies show. Third, the norms of good use and the values conveyed exclude certain publics. At the same time, these are stigmatized as bad users, modest families who land on Porquerolles Island with their coolers, uh, young people from social housing who set fire to the creeks, queer customs such as picnics which, which create problems in the National Park of La Réunion. This stigmatization obscures the diversity of uses of these publics, which our field surveys with Arlette Era have allowed to highlight. It hides 
the rich relationships between the nature and the queer inhabitants or between the nature and um, the popular users uh, of La Cayolle near Marseille, in Marseille. It also restricts the conception of who deserves to be welcomed. Following that, who supports the environmental effort? If the choice is made to require for an equal contribution, for example, the ban on harvesting endemic species in La Réunion and fishing in the no-tech areas in Le Calanque, it applies equally, equally to everyone. This is known as commutative justice. However, the environmental effort involved is highly inequal, depending in particular on the degree of economic dependence and the ability of the users to find alternatives. There are very few, these alternatives are very few. For example, for herbal tea makers um, in La Réunion, or for the smallest boat fishermen in Le Calanque. A fair and efficient way of distributing the environmental effort is to refer to the impact of the various uses. However, the impacts are scientifically difficult to assess, including that of overvisiting. This has been pointed out several times by the member of scientific councils of the three parks, and it is also noticed in the Fuvel report about the Calan visiting or in our study on the carrying capacity on Porquerolles Island. The distribution of the environmental effort depends less on an objective impact than on the social legitimacy of the uses and the users, some of whom are strongly disqualified and others more valued, such as climbing, hiking, and running. So the environmental effort is unevenly distributed, and that raises issues in terms of ethics and effectiveness. At least, let us look at the issue of participation. The 26th reform of French parks um, is part of a participatory shift that affects public action more broadly. It represents also a response to effectiveness regarding uh, to the failure of French national park creation since 1989. It also represents a response to a concern in terms of equity. The French Girand report, which preceded the law, has explicitly recognized the rights and the role of local indigenous users, but not in the IUCN sense here in this text, in the conservation of the natural areas. This law gives them more powers to the local elected and to the local users in the definition of the park charts and in the authorities. But its implementation has resulted in the consecration of that we have called an instituted local, giving more voice to those who already had voice Thus, in the genesis of the Calanque National Park, participation was, restrict was restricted to local users who were strongly, collectively organized and well recognized because they had social and cultural resources to assert the legitimacy of their local uses and of their knowledge of the nature. So we have called that the environmental capital of indig indigenousness. They use discriminating principle of justice, such as a certain conception, conception of merit, and they reinforce social standards 
of traditional good uses. In the free pass, this participa participatory opening has thus contributed to reinforcing environmental inequalities rather than combating them. So, in conclusion, our work provides some insights into the dimensions of equity expected within a natural protected area distributive, procedural, and recognition. They also show they are mutually reinforcing. The processes of producing environmental inequalities are rarely intentional. And park field officers are under a lot of pressure, have to make a lot of work, a lot of daily decisions. Moreover, Winning over the territory strong public to the cause, the force vive, as it's written in the French Giron report, seems to be a necessity. To avoid the strongest opposition and to benefit from the, from the organizational capacity and also the regulatory capacity, for example, to reduce the important basic fishing, poaching, an endemic species, species in La Réunion, thanks to the powerful fishing federation. It can seem ecologically efficient and fair from the perspective of decision makers and key players, strong stakeholders involved in the conservation. But not in the sense of environmental justice, articulating, ecological and social concerns, because it exacerbates environmental inequalities in terms of access, impacts, ability to influence policies and benefits from the effects and so on. And we may assume that this exacerbation is harmful to conservation as it is more widely harmful to the environment. It leads to keep on looking for another way to define conservation policy, including more social concerns. Thanks a lot. Wonderful. Thank you for this presentation and for sort of showing that protected areas are not just yeah. far south, but also very close to us. And that there's a very wide diversity of <laughs> problems associated to them. Um, we'll discuss together what the common points and the differences are. Uh, let's hear now Raphael Matve for the last talk of the morning uh, before the round table. Welcome, Raphael. Bien. Uh, well, uh, sorry. So, um, thank you for. Um, so, good morning, everyone. Thank you for your invitation to, to contribute to this session. Uh, and thank you uh, all for organizing uh, this, uh, this event. So uh, my talk is on environmental justice or the relationships between environmental justice uh, shifting baseline and conservation policy uh, in the Rhone River Delta. Sorry. I check. Uh, so this talk is part of a long-term study on uh, human uh, nature interaction in the Camargue, especially uh, regarding the history of uh, hunting. And uh, we used to focus uh, during the last five years on the five species uh, that are listed here. And uh, we do this in collaboration, and we did it uh, in collaboration with Office Francais de la Biodiversité and our colleagues and friends from uh, Tour du Valais, especially uh, Arnaud Béchet and uh, Anthony Olivier. Uh, of course, uh, the spirit of this work is a kind of uh, engaged uh, pluralism, and we try to uh, 
to use a set of frameworks and to uh, to uh, enroll a, a set of uh, disciplines. So of course we try to uh, work on the controversies and with the sociology uh, uh, effort, uh, and uh, also uh, we try to integrate. Uh, relational approach to uh, to uh, nature conservation uh, especially as developed in the cultural geography but also we try to analyze uh, environmental governance uh, and we use for that uh, the framework from uh, political ecology and during the last five, or five, five years I, I engage also uh, within animal geography and we try to, to see how uh, animals are actors in the construction of uh, territories, uh, human societies and economies. And also this work helps us to, uh, to think about uh, the, what are the boundaries between the humans and the non-humans. And I really think that uh, using this, uh, all these disciplines is very interesting because the, the overlaps of this discipline is, uh, I would say, uh, uh, fertile soil and is a very productive ground for conservation science, but also conservation action. So the method we use is we try to analyze the, the historical trajectory, the social and ecological trajectory of uh, how uh, humans interacted with uh, the habitats and with uh, these uh, species in the, in the Camargue. And for that, we use rather classical uh, methodology uh, based on uh, interviews. And we try also to uh, explore deeper uh, private and public archives I mean there, for instance, uh, hunting, hunting bags from uh, uh, public estate or private estates. And uh, we use, of course, my background is ecology and geography. We try to use uh, and to uh, explore and analyze uh, old maps uh, because it's very useful to assess the baseline uh, shifting. And uh, we also use a quantitative approach and we develop with my former PhD student, Carol Vuillot, a method to compare and to elicit social representation and to compare them uh, through a free listing approach. So today what I decided uh, last night is to focus on the flamingos because uh, uh, to focus on the book we published last year, exactly the first day of the lockdown. So we were very lucky, so I am happy to present here, here uh, at this, uh, this uh, event. And we have written this book with uh, Arnaud Bechet, who is a specialist of the biology, of the ecology of flamingo, but also of their conservation in the Mediterranean area at the Tour du Valla. And in this book, we explore the politics and also the policies, and we try to explore and to discuss our own capacity to, uh, I would say, to, uh, to build and also to implement a successful uh, conservation uh, policy. So I guess, yes, why we are talking about the grid flamingo is the key question, the first one. So, uh, of course, it's an emblematic uh, species of Mediterranean wetland. Uh, and more recently, during the last years, uh, NGOs decided to promote the idea that uh, uh, Flamingo co could be the ambassador of the protection of wetlands. And me, personally, I was not comfortable with, uh, with this idea because, uh, yes, the, the Camargue, as you may know, the Rhone River Delta in the southern France, not far from here, is clearly the, the bastion uh, of the species in the Mediterranean area. But when you check the, 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 the landscape of the Camargue, Camargue is also the largest marina uh, in Europe. It's also one of the largest commercial and industrial harbor uh, in the Mediterranean area. And uh, the salt pans that are there are also the largest uh, salt industry uh, in the world. And inland, the, the farming system is based on large estate and is one of uh, a very intensive farming system uh, so far. So to have uh, this uh, flamingo, uh, I would say that is doing so well, going so well in this kind of landscape was for me uh, a question and uh, should be uh, deba debatable. So it's what we did. Uh, in this book, because of course the Rhone River Delta is not only that, 
the Rhone River Delta covers about uh, 150,000 hectares. It's uh, the place of conservation in France with a lot of conservation measures. It's a man and biosphere, a biosphere reserve, and it's also a set of Ramsar sites. And it's uh, managed, uh, I would say, uh, facilitated by a natural regional park there. And the Camargue is interesting because more than 30,000 hectares now are protected. And uh, the main landowner now is the Conservatoire de Littoral, that is the Coastal Protection Agency uh, at the French uh, level. And Camargue is also interested because uh, it's the place where a lot of stakeholders decided uh, to try to experiment for more than uh, 50 years now to try to conciliate human activities with biodiversity conservation. And it's an interesting place because, as we have seen in the presentation of Tanya, for instance, it's the place where we build conservation against people. It's a place where we build conservation uh, despite people. It's a place where we build conservation with people and uh, for people. So we experimented all this, and it's so that's why the Camargue is a very uh, interesting place for that. So the questions that we are exploring in this book are rather basic, and uh, it's what do we really know about the flamingo from a scientific perspective, and I will not go deeper on this point. Uh, it was also two other questions, important question. It's what we have done to the flamingo, and what in turn the flamingo make us to do. And uh, to make a, a success story very short, uh, regarding the preservation of the flamingo. Let's consider that the first evidence of the breeding of the flamingo in Camargue dates back to the mid 16th century. And uh, the, 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 the bird was more or less always an irregular uh, nester in the, this part of, the, of France and of the Mediterranean area. And following a, a series of failures of in the breeding uh, during the 60s, Luc Hoffman, uh, who uh, decided to create the biological station of Tour du Valla in Camargue, decided with the partnership of uh, the salt industry company and uh, with a set of bird enthusiasts and scientists to create uh, an island, an artificial island, to facilitate the reproduction, the regular reproduction of the bird and to save it. And so they, they did amazing work in terms of conservation action. They created, of course, this island because, as you know, with the embankment of the two arms of the river and the embankment of the sea, uh, of the sea coast, of the coastal area. The, the natural process of creation of the islands was not existing anymore. So we, that's why they decided to create this island for this colonial uh, water bird. So they decided to regulate predator, uh, seagulls especially. They decided to uh, uh, establish a garden, gar guarding uh, system uh, to uh, they, they develop a tremendous uh, a scientific uh, program, long-term study program and monitoring. So based on all this, uh, we, the, the flamingo is expanding now and it's safe. It's a less concerned status for IOCN now. And we can say that it's a very uh, successful uh, story. But the problem is that, of course, uh, the flamingos, uh, you know, the taste of rice. The rice of Camargue is very famous for its taste. <laughs> and, uh, of course, the, the, the flamingos, they started to eat uh, to f their feeding in the rice field at the end of the 70s. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, they develop uh, farmers, develop scary programs and so on with a set of tools. But uh, it was not really efficient, and it's better to have a human presence in the field to avoid such kind of damage. And here we have some environmental justice issue because there is no compensatory, no compensation system. If you have problem with wolf or with bear in the Pyrenean mountain in, uh, in France, you have a compensation system that is paid by state and the European Union. If you have problem with a wild boar, or if you have problem with uh, uh, with red deer, a big game, uh, you have a compensation system that is uh, organized by hunters, but no compensation for the flamingos, and this creates a feeling of um, 
and justice there. The second point is the opportunity uh, following the uh, economic crisis in 2007 and 8. Uh, the private uh, salt company decided to sell uh, 6,500 hectares of former salt pans. And uh, after a lot of negotiation between the state and the Coastal Conservation Agency, uh, the, 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 these 6,500 hectares were bought. And it was the opportunity to decide to stop this process of maintaining during uh, the three decades the, the very good condition for the reproduction of the birds and to decide to experiment the idea to to put the emphasis on the evolutionary potential that I guess you discussed the forecoming days, uh, the previous days. And uh, for that, and also to experiment solution based, uh, nature based solution, uh, and to go for a free dynamics and free evolution management uh, regarding the, the rising of the sea levels. And all this was done among the stakeholders, among mostly the managers of the protected area, the new protected area, and the new landowner, and communication gap, and also uh, former power issues uh, make this project very difficult, and there is very low social acceptability, and the perceived risk of salinity rise in the soil and in the water, and the perceived risk of uh, flooding from the sea is rising and the situation is growing and is more and more conflictual and of course environmentalists, conservationists and uh, state services are seen as, uh, as responsible of all the, the bad change that uh, are occurring presently uh, in the Delta. So the, what happened is that in the central part of the Camargue, so it's the historic, historic nesting island, there is, we decided, or the conservationist, the scientist, and the manager of this place decided to adopt, uh, to change the water control, to change, uh, to make the choice of the variability for, to save the bird and to restore the, the, the former lagoon system. And they decided to abandon the, the maintenance of the dike along the coast. And, uh, in the same time, in the Western Camargue, the salt industry uh, company decided in Egmort to develop, to use the knowledge from conservationists and scientists to build a new nesting island, to develop water control and to attract the nesting of uh, the breeding of the flamingos there. So, uh, and they were successful thanks to, uh, with the help of the comeback of the Bubo Bubo, the uh, Eurasian uh, giant uh, eagle owl that uh, decided, that came back in Kamang and decided to feed on the former historic nesting place to start to hunt flamingos. So the story of flamingos is interesting is because in the central part of the Camargue, you promote variability, Mediterranean variability, ecological restoration based on nature-based solution. You promote free access, but regulated uses. And in the other part, you try to attract the flamingo and to promote a commodification of nature. You have to pay to access to the beach. You have to pay to visit the salpan. You have to pay to visit the breeding place, and so on, and so on. So for the western part of the Camargue and the salt industry, it's interesting because for them, it's a local recognition of their good practices. And it's a good way also for greening their own activities. So in the western part, they are able to add to the cultural heritage of the uh, old city of Egmort, the industrial heritage of the salt pan industry, but also the natural heritage with the emblematic uh, flamingo. So what are the lessons that we can uh, draw from this? Uh, the first one is that we have a shifting baseline of on what is wild and what is uh, nature in Camargue. Uh, during the last decades, I am not talking about the shifting baseline uh, syndrome of Pauli there. Uh, I mean here that we are using always a set of categories to describe the 
uh, the world and the nature or the place where we are. We use natural versus artificial, domestic versus wild. And of course, in Camargue, it's always changing uh, according people and uh, according time. And uh, the measure we did of or the social representation of the tourists, what the, the social representation tourists have of the wilderness in the Camargue is interesting because in the core of the social representation, you have only domestic and cultural icons. I mean bulls, horses, guardians, the French cowboys, and uh, marshes. And what is interesting is that uh, even rice farming industry, they use uh, the wilderness, uh, they use uh, remote places with a few human infrastructure to promote their own activity that need water control and that need, of course, artificialization and control of the system. The other point we underline in this book and that we uh, unpack is that we need to recognize uh, the diversity of nature because the diversity of natures that we have in Camargue uh, means a diversity of management regimes. And because we have this diversity of management regimes, we have a diversity of institutions. And this diversity of institutions is contributing of the social ecological resilience of the Delta face to uh, change in the economy market, uh, farming mar uh, market or change or uh, we'll say uh, climate change. And the problem is that during the last decades, uh, the sociological work has been instrumentalized and uh, it's not possible to discuss about nature in Camargue because very often uh, local stakeholders, they use the sociological work that has been done during the 70s and stating always that Camargue is artificial. That's it. We don't have to discuss anymore about nature in Camargue. The second point is it's very difficult to get out of the what we call the management power. That means uh, all the managers, for, they are hunting managers, they are hunting unit managers, protected area managers. During the last decades, they applied, they tried to develop control and to reduce uh, uncertainty and to be predictable. And it's difficult to go back freedom. It's difficult to integrate evolutionary perspective and to be sure that the, flam the wild flamingo that we observe uh, in the Camargue are, are less close uh, to uh, 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 flamingo from zoo. And the last point is the difficult, of course, to being able to act on ecosystem, to stop to act on ecosystem. And uh, my colleagues and scientists involved in the conservation and the project of, uh, of the ecological restoration of the former salpant experiment that presently it's difficult to, to stop to act in a huge landscape where, of course, people used to consider that uh, you have to fight against nature forces. And the last lesson is that uh, the challenge for any stakeholders there is definitely to try to control the discourse on the evolution and the change that are occurring in the, uh, over the Camargue in order to control the future and to be sure that his own interest is part of this future. And uh, what we can say is maybe that what we can call the excessive rationalism, as defined by Dreisek in his work on environmental discourse, is dominating in Camargue and is counterproductive. And uh, I mean that limiting the, the climate change policies to nature-based solutions uh, doesn't provide enough space for uh, reshaping governance, reshaping ideas, and it's difficult to... Uh, to address the local challenges of sea level rise. And uh, the, the discourse of uh, any institution, the natural regional park, scientists, scientific committee, whatever, who you are, where you are, you appear totally disconnected from reality. And it's a major uh, failure. So to conclude, uh, because I don't know at all where I am in terms of schedule, um, but Let's consider it as a good news. Um, in terms of environmental justice, if I go back to the very broad definition uh, 
that is proposed by uh, Valérie and uh, the group who is working especially uh, on that. Uh, I would say that we, uh, the issue for us is to find a way to address both social but also ecological justice because we need both to, to resolve uh, our problem on the ground. And in, from a theoretical perspective, that means it's, uh, we, we have to, to find a way to avoid the merging because a lot of uh, work is all, uh, uh, let's consider that a lot of works are uh, merging uh, issue of social justice of local users of former commons or new commons that you try to create with uh, the issues of justice with very rich and powerful uh, landowners. So we have to find a way to deal with uh, this issue. And I know that my colleagues that are working in South America, uh, of course, are dealing with that. So we have a lot to learn from the experience from colleagues that are working in the South and to integrate the experience in the North. Uh, because we have to define who are the people. It's amazing in all the participatory processes, we are always talking about people. And we are we invented uh, one word with uh, Florian Chavolin. It's uh, le public putatif. So that means that we are always inventing inventing the public, the public that can be concerned, that can be involved in the project, but we don't know who he is exactly. So we have to make some effort to m characterize better the people, and uh, also it should be a way to deal with the amazing uh, growing populism that we, uh, we have to face on, on the ground. The second conclusion, there is only five conclusions. No, I, I am kidding. It's uh, the second one, but uh, we have to integrate emotional and uh, affectual relationships. I mean that it's uh, key factors of change and uh, Till now, we focus too more on the scientific issues, we focus too more on project, project framing, and we are excluding emotional and affectual relationship between humans and non-humans. And one way to, to do so is to go back to attachment. And in Camargue especially, there is a very important uh, attachment. It's the attachment to the land and, it's, uh, and the, the issue of transmission of the land. And uh, the land is clearly affected. And uh, when there is the transmission, the landowners is also always trying to transmit to the new owner, not only the piece of land and the fertility of soil, but also uh, how he values uh, the landscape, how he values uh, the, the bull games or the customs or traditions. So there is a urgent need, of course, to adopt this non-anthropocentric view, but to be uh, to uh, to uh, to try to explore how uh, we can uh, examine uh, the status of non-humans or other than humans as political subjects. Uh, for for that, uh, it's the last conclusion. We need to explore the condition of how developing uh, what we can call and. Uh, it's a typical discussion we had with Ricardo a few years ago and uh, during the coffee break, how to explore what could be the good condition for uh, promoting social ecological stewardship of territory based on ecological solidarity, based on respect for nature. Because in many places we try now to, and we observe that people try to recreate commons but that means very often to recreate community because especially in Western countries, the community are uh, deleted or uh, disappeared. So we have to recreate and to rebuild this community. And one way to do so is to reconstruct, of course, the history of places and to integrate the long durée and to use and to discuss the attachment not only to the place, but to the different attributes that uh, we can uh, use to characterize the landscape. And the last point, I think, is a new uh, area for investigation. And uh, for me, it's very promising. 
we have maybe to explore the way uh, the social economy and the solidarity economy is dealing with how taking care uh, of what uh, we value and exploring the social utilities. So maybe by exploring the social utilities of any uses of any project would be a way to uh, to approach value in a way that uh, is uh, highly dependent of the quality of the process of evaluation. So maybe we have just to, to find a way, just is maybe too, more, too much, but uh, it's a big deal for us uh, to continue to work with uh, conservation ecologists, with managers, with scientists, uh, with philosophers to try to see how, what kind of participatory tool, participatory modeling approach, whatever, how we can uh, recognize the order that is shaping the landscape, the non-human and the humans, how to, to build knowledge, to build uh, trust and to build, uh, of course, uh, this evaluating process how to evaluate the, the social and ecological uh, interdependencies. And it's only the way for me that uh, could uh, uh, bring us and, uh, uh, a good uh, opportunity to, to contribute to create uh, a society, but to create new commons in protected areas and their, and their surrounding. Thanks. So thank you. Thanks very much, Raphael. <laughs> Thank you for reminding us of how messy reality can be and how complex things are in the field. So now we're going to start the round table. Uh, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm going to ask all the speakers to join us here. And then we have two, two other speakers online. And we're going to try and um, organize this discussion. Should be room for everybody the way we we counted the chairs. There's one chair left here. Okay, we have one extra. Great. <laughs> oh, no. Say in. <laughs> okay, so uh, before we kick off the discussion, um, we have a newcomer at the table. Uh, who is Jean Jalabert, who, uh, Jean Jalbert, pardon, who uh, manages uh, La Tour du Vala, which is a very original structure, which is also uh, in the Camargue, uh, the Rhone Delta. Uh, I'm going to give him a few minutes to speak about uh, uh, Tour du Vala and about how he reacts to what has been discussed this morning uh, and the impact, the input he can give us. OK, thank you, Yves. Uh, thank you very much. It was really a fascinating morning and uh, very much in line with, with what we are facing. And so very inspiring for us. Just a few words about what is Tour du Vala. It's a research institution, a research institute for wetland conservation. We are based in the Rhone Delta, in the Camargue. It has been established some almost 70 years ago by Luc Hoffman, Raphael mentioned in his talk. Um, and when uh, Luke Hoffman came to the Camargue just after the Second World War, he, wa he fell in love with this site. He was attracted by birds, but it, he fell in love with the Camargue uh, uh, as a whole. And he discovered the Camargue just when this post-World War recovery plan were, were activated. And the Marshall Plan, you know, all these uh, activities, are, and he saw the marshes disappearing under the caterpillars. And initially, he thought that we should fight against human activities. But very, very, very quickly, he changed his mind and came to the conclusion that we, we should reconcile human with, with nature. And since then, since the, the 50s, this is the, 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 the way we are working, trying to reconcile humans with nature. We, beyond being a research center, we are uh, also uh, a large estate. We are owning 2,600 uh, hectares of land in the Camargue, which are 
both a nature reserve but also a, an experimental field what, where we, we test how to reconcile human with nature. And we are producing rice, we are uh, raising cattle, we are producing wine, we are producing, we are hunting. And for all these activities, we are find, trying to find where should be the best balance between having a, a productive activity, socially um, satisfactory, but also uh, uh, preserving biodiversity. And this is really amazing to, to be able to, to, to test this. And the idea is really not just to keep it for ourselves, but to, if we, we believe we find the, the, a good balance, to try to, to transfer, to, to, to expand, and to find other people doing this. And so we are working on at, at, at experimental level and site level, but we are also quite active at policy level, where, for example, in the 50s, Luke Hoffman thought that to, to safeguard wetlands, which were disappearing very fast, we, we needed both to act on the field, but also to act at political level. And this came to uh, the, 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 the fact that the first ever international environmental agreement came into uh, real life in 1961. It's a, the Ramsar Convention on, on, on wetlands, which paved the way for the, 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 the UN conventions on climate and on biodiversity and, and desertification. So, and we are going to be very active on during the, the next, uh, the, this IUCN Congress starting today, on different policy fora or, or, or technical fora, especially advocating for nature-based solutions. Coming back to just, I, I'm trying to be short there, to, to, to expand a bit the, the scope to the Camargue, not Tour du val but the Camargue, Raphael has quite uh, set the scene perfectly. Just to mention that as an actor of the Camargue, um, the, 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 as, he, as Raphael clearly mentioned, the Camargue is a kind of paradox. The paradox that the image of the Camargue is a pristine nature full of flamingos, white bulls, horses, and so on. But the reality, reality is that the Camargue is a very managed artificial um, landscape. But still with outstanding biodiversity. And this is the beauty of the thing. That during the one and a half century after the Camargue has been put into dikes, at the end of the 19th century, it has been converted by a, a number of actors, both for initially for, for developing the Camargue, for, for developing industrial agri agriculture, for developing tourism, but also a number of actors, and initially it was the cultural actors who take the lead fighting for preserving the Camargue. And during the first half of the 20th century, it was the cultural actors, especially what we call the Feli, but the, the, the people who defended the Provencal culture against the, 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 the weight from, from Paris, you know, who want to add a homogenized culture over France. So they, they, they were the first defenders of the nature and culture of the Camargue. Then after uh, protection laws came into force in France, it was mostly the, the, the environmental actors who took the lead of the protection. And this Camargue today, which is a, a quite interesting and balanced set mosaic of different landscapes, natural areas, salt pans, touristic activities, uh, intensive agriculture, extensive grazing, quite balanced compared to any other delta in the world, is not the result of you know, free-flowing life, but free of a fight, a strong fight between actors, cultural actors, economic actors, and, and uh, nature conservation actors. And this fight, we, we have, through these fights, we have come to a kind of consensus where um, um, there is a kind of an agreement between the economic actors and the, the nature conservation actors, where nature is, let's say, tolerated as long as it doesn't harm economic activities. So nature uh, area managers have to, to manage their, their areas, keeping nature between, you know, uh, uh, compatible uh, level of salinity, water level, and so on, not to harm the, 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 the economic activities. But this, this consensus is going to be, uh, has been broken some years ago and is broken, as, as Raphael mentioned, especially due uh, to another force, external force, which is the climate change effects. And especially due to this change in rainfall patterns, uh, strong coastal erosions, this illusion of stability, which has been built one and a half years ago after the, the, the Camargue has been embanked, uh, proves to be an illusion. And, 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 and we can't anymore manage the Camargue to keep between the boundary of what is felt satisfactory to all actors. And this is quite interesting, but also quite 
you know, <laughs> painful because we, we are at the, in the middle of, of, of um, uh, new, 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 new era of the Kama to be built. And we do strongly believe that we, we have here all the, the ingredients to make the Kama a perfect lab for, of the adaptation and resilience. While a number of actors, especially the economic and touristic actors, want to keep the Camargue as it was along the, the last century, and here is the, what, what we have heard is, is, is really, um, really precious for me to, to, yeah, to try to, to, to act as appropriately as possible to move forward and not to, to increase the tensions which are quite harsh at the moment. Thanks very much, Jean. Um, so now everybody has spoken. Um, Maybe uh, Virginie can kick off the discussion uh, with a few remarks. I think that's what we plan to do. So, go ahead. Yes, with pleasure. First, I, I want to thank all the uh, talkers and people around this table because I think it has been a very, very uh, enthusiastic and uh, enriching uh, session. I'm really happy for that. Uh, and uh, I just want to address a couple of uh, issues that I think are um, maybe passing through the different uh, conferences, uh, but I want to emphasize their importance. While addressing both the ethical and justice problems in this session, we wanted to tackle in the same time the issue of first the responsibility of conservation toward others and human beings and supra individual natural entities such as rivers or mountains or wetlands and so on and also the responsibility of conservation regarding justice toward people and communities uh, the this justice issues has to do with the burdens and benefits of, of um, conservation and how they are distributed between people, but also who can take part of decision, who is recognized as legitimators, actors of conservation, and so on. Maybe one dimension of justice that has not been invoked today is what we call retributive justice. This has to do with the schemes uh, we um, invent in order to address or redress past injustice. Uh, I want to emphasize this uh, dimension of justice uh, in order to um, um, uh, in introduce my first point, which is how uh, conservation today has to deal with decoloniza decolonization. Yildiz mentioned uh, this necessity of decolonizing uh, our way to think and to do conservation, and Chloe also uh, directly addressed it. There is a strong critical movement today that target conservation as um, precluded by a uh, colonialist uh, uh, way to think and to act. Historically, uh, how conservation policies and uh, some conservation international NGOs have been actively engaged into colonialism. I think uh, we should not just put this under the carpet. This has to be uh, expressly, explicitly addressed and somehow metabolized uh, in the way we want to uh, address our relationship between science, conservation, and uh, people. Uh, still today, some practices in conservation and in science are still entangled more or less consciously in a colonialist and racist culture. I, I, I want to mention this because it's as if uh, we have a lot of uh, terms and uh, aims like biocultural rights and intercultural uh, uh, relationships, blah, blah, blah. But we should uh, maybe more than any other uh, field of science and practices be very conscious and auto-reflexive about this past and this present um, engagement or uh, entanglements 
with uh, colonialism. The second point I want to uh, put uh, in the discussion is uh, anti-capitalism. Uh, uh, there are many concepts and approaches that have been uh, defended, like biocultural rights, socio-ecological resilience, sustainable livelihood, ecological solidarity, and so on. However, the main drivers of killing and alienation of people and the destruction of nature are somehow poorly addressed. Uh, capitalism, productivism, extractivism are some words we haven't pronounced uh, in the session. Um, I think we should have in mind who are the Mr. Chauvin you mentioned, Ricardo, who are the idiots who act for themselves and who are conscious by killing people and destroying nature that they are follow their own uh, interest only. Conservation cannot only be a story of harmony and reconciliation. While some people and some interests are making a war against nature and against people. So I, I want to add this uh, maybe unharmonious and um, um, I don't know, maybe aggressive tone in the discussion. There is a war and there is a fact that has to be taken as such. And third, uh, I think that conservation may cultivate a multinaturalist or a non-anthropocentrist concept of the place and role of human beings, including conservationists and scientists themselves, into nature or into the community of life. Indeed, the philosophical roots of conservation are made of a strong commitment to protect nature and natural entities for themselves um, uh, without any regard to any human interest and often against human over-exploitation or human destruction. Some human wildlife conflicts, and it has been uh, showed uh, uh, in different occasions this morning, uh, may still remain irreducible, especially in the fast-changing world we are uh, living now. I think it's crucial to multiply and pluralize the variety of voices that should be heard and that should be taken into account in conservation. But maybe conservationists are um, the only one or at least uh, the few ones that can uh, carry the voice of nature and the voice of others and human entities into the public debate. That's why I think that even if it's extremely important to be conscious and to address directly um, justice issues and um, um, uh, sustainable use issues, etc., a special care and a special attention to non-human beings and non-human entities uh, should remain in the concern of uh, conservation. Well, um, I think that was the three points I want to put in the discussion, like the um, fight, uh, uh, fighting uh, scene where uh, conservation has to, uh, with which conservation has to deal with. Uh, and maybe now we can uh, open the discussion with the panelists. Do we have um, questions? Do we open to question now, or do you yeah, want me to uh, open with a question? We have a few questions, okay. but before uh, we start with them, I'm just going to ask if anyone here wants to pick up on the great points that you've made. Um, sometimes a bit provocative, but that's what we're here for. So the the conversation around um, decolonializing research and decolonializing conservation is a very um, important topic in in our center where I work. And there's a, a part, and most of our work is actually around that. Um, so it's, it's thank you for bringing that up. I am aware that I didn't go into that debate around capitalism and retrib retributive justice because it's controversial. And um, I wasn't sure that it was appropriate to do that. But I think it is a, a, crucial, a crucial and absolutely critical point to make. 
and I'm grateful that we can have this conversation in this kind of forum and bring this issue um, to everyone. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, um, thanks Virginie for bringing the possibility to explicitly uh, address more some of the specific causes of the problem. Um, regarding conservation and colonialism imposition, I think the other side of the coin is that many communities have to conserve their watershed their forests to get in water. And the number of resistance movements around the world, it's remarkable. And one of the conservation uh, frameworks that brings this to, together with justice is the Environmentalists of the Poor by Martinez Allier. And uh, he has been working in many areas of the world, particularly in Latin America too. So resistance, then what about uh, post-colonialism, I think we are now in an ultra-colonialism. I, I think, yes, we talk about decolonizing the language, a decolonial movement, but we are under a neo-extractivist wave in many areas of the world that is unprecedented, and so we need to address that. And so what are the conditions of possibility? I would say let's go back to biophysical possibilities. Land grabbing is continue raising. The assassination of environmental and social leaders of many uh, origins in Latin America, particularly Jesuits and people to the church, indigenous leaders, some indigenous leaders with public profile globally, like some of uh, Berta Cáceres, who gave a, a public speech, very constructive, very lucid against capitalism in favor of feminism, in favor of multiple values, murdered at her bed a uh, few months after receiving the Goldman Award. Uh, that's one case that has high visibility, but that it's everyday life. So I w put the tension between post-colonialism and ultra-colonialism, uh, what is going on right now. And again, how to face plutocracy today, which is one of the, the issues at stake. And I would say that this uh, session uh, addresses different regions of the world, different kind of common sense, deeply historically rooted, uh, in many continents, including Europe. And I say that because we need to go beyond stereotypes. I mean, there are people that care for the vineyards, that care for the meadows and husbandry activities, and they're also equally displaced today as in Asia, as in Latin America. So I would say this goes beyond the old structures of rights and left, uh, nature is considered, and in our experience in Chile, which we are experiencing a, a very interesting process right now of writing the constitution again and talking about nature, one aspect that was very remarkable is that of the 155 representatives for writing the new constitution, more than half of all of them are independent people. So what I want to say, we need to maybe question also this old categories for criticizing the systems, but I would fully agree with you, Virginie, that we need to be more precise on the diagnosis of the agents of the problems. And we often find the emissions of carbons, pollutions, there are a few. And if we identify them better, maybe we can deal with them better. It's like with the COVID. If we identify the virus, it's better, but most viruses are good. So that diagnosis is critical. So I'll just add that uh, to what you said uh, about the assassinations that uh, from a journalist point of view, uh, one of the very recent changes on this international scene is that environmental journalists have become the category of journalists with the largest number of deaths, of assassinations, I mean. Uh, and that was actually above um, war journalists. So this is a very 
interesting, I mean, b beside being tragic, it also says something about the world we're in and about uh, where the conflicts are and where they are shifting. Uh, it's it's uh, an important thing to consider. Uh, you wanted to add something. Yes, I, I totally agree with Ricardo and I want to come back on this idea that uh, I, I'm, I mean, I don't totally agree that uh, conservation should lie only within the hands of conservationists or conservation managers because uh, there's a, a very deep history of uh, conservation and conservation managers which, which has, um, uh, which is highly linked to geopolitical, uh, I mean, power uh, at the global level. Uh, in terms of uh, who are the NGOs, who, where the money comes from for the conservation NGOs, uh, who decides what will be the decisions of these NGOs. And I don't think it is enough uh, uh, in terms simply of thinking to say that the conservationists are those who will be really caring for non-humans because uh, there's too much underlying uh, situations of power behind, which is highly geopolitical at the global level. I'm from the Indian Ocean, so I, I know, for instance, what happens in, in, uh, in Madagascar. I mean, it's highly geopolitical in terms of occupation of land by uh, NGOs, in terms of uh, occupation. Uh, protected areas are also geopolitical areas and occupied not only by the local people, but by uh, foreign countries. So there are highly political issues behind which we have not much discussed here, nor have we discussed issues of war and conflicts, which are linked, in fact, to conservation. So um, yes, I, I think uh, pluralism uh, will help um, to a large ex extent. I think uh, regarding this issue of violence, uh, of course, I totally agree with you. And I guess uh, today we have to address this. And the people who are suffering violence, uh, those I've been talking about, I mean, indigenous people, local communities, uh, are counting on conservation forums to to put forward uh, their situation. In fact, they are using this, uh, this track. Uh, and, and this is important. Uh, today at five o'clock, there is a demonstration on the street in, in, in Marseille by the indigenous people. So, so it's a battle now. It's, uh, and, and here we cannot decide. It, it will come from, from the ground. And, and I think they have a, a role to play and uh, we cannot decide here that, uh, you know, who, in fact, uh, um, it, it's, it's, it's a social struggle. Thank you. So, uh, um, ha, uh, okay, this is a topic that everyone wants to jump in. Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Sure. Thank you. No, just a few words on this issue raised by Virginie of, uh, of uh, capitalism and, and, and the interests of local communities. Just to mention that things are not always as simple or as, as, as logical as we could think. Uh, just the example of the Camargue, where um, um, the local communities who are supposed and cl claim to hold the interests of the Camargue at large, its history, its culture, a part of them and a large part of them, and the, those who are claiming the, the loudest they are, they are, that they are representing the Camargue, are practicing uh, an in industrial agriculture which is really harmful to the Camargue itself. And they are, they are claiming, holding the interests of the non-humans and humans and everything, but they are, in fact, only holding their own interest. So here we have to be careful on, on what what is the, the the player's game and how to 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 be active and you know have impact. Of course, R Raphael, you want to add something? Yes, maybe uh, three points. Thank you, Virginie, for for that. Regarding uh, retributive justice. Uh, uh, I think that it's not only um, a problem with uh, colonialism, it's also a justice uh, in France. In most of our uh, protected area, the, the present conflicts are clearly shaped by former conflicts. And, uh, and it, they are mostly uh, ecologization, I would say, of uh, conflict of uh, 
natural resource access and uh, management uh, right uh, issues that we had to deal with in the past. Regarding the causes uh, anti-capitalism, productivism, extractivist, I think most of the people are aware of that. Uh, and most of the people would like to that have concern for the environment, they would like to exit from uh, from this dominant model uh, that is neoliberal and capitalist. And uh, but what I would like to highlight here is very shortly is that we need all energies, and we have a lot of positive energies everywhere. And I think we need energies from reformists. We need energies from uh, prosaic people. We need energies from imaginative people and, of course, of radical people to push uh, uh, everything. But I think uh, that we have to take care uh, to, to not uh, discriminate or disqualify uh, some uh, of these uh, people uh, representative of these various energies. And the last point is regarding... Uh, uh, the, the, the responsibility, I think the basis of everything, as you have said already uh, in several presentations, is the respect for nature. Uh, I, I have in mind uh, your work, of course, and also of John Passmore. And uh, the idea is, of course, to, to start from the, the respect for nature and uh, to assess the responsibility. And once again, one way to do it, and I think we should explore that with... Uh, with more rigor is to explore uh, the, the social utilities concept. Uh, if we apply this for the uses, for, for the promoting uh, the pair regulation or to, to promote social uh, recognition of action and so on, it can be a way, maybe not uh, uh, in emergency state as you described, but it can be a way to, to, to work and to uh, also to acknowledge antagonism, because very often we, we are not uh, acknowledging uh, this antagonism. That's a lot of great thoughts. Um, yeah. um, Chloe, you wanted to add something? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, the discussion and the session has been very inspiring for me also, because I'm, I'm an ecologist by training and I had the opportunity to work in Zimbabwe for the past 10 years. And I felt I didn't have the background actually to, when I realized what conservation was in the field, initially I was doing just modeling in Paris at the Cisco. And when I went to Zimbabwe and I realized the reality of, of conservation, then um, I really faced a personal challenge the way of how should I engage, you know, in this, both this scientific career, but also the responsibility I have towards the people I work with. And as you mentioned, uh, indigenous people, we, we, we are the only platform, we are the only people that can speak for them because they are not given the voice on the floor, or they are not given the voice, the, the floor, sorry. So, um, and actually, you know, um, when, when Sirad um, proposed, invited me to collaborate in their development project. I was a bit skeptical because all the development projects have been seen in the Wangi area where, you know, didn't have very positive outcome. So I was very puzzled, but I work with friends and colleagues and we trusted each other, which helped us to work together. And so I haven't been in Wangi for the past two years because of the pandemic. I'm very worried about bringing anything there. Um, and our, yeah, and so I'm going there in the next 10 days after two years, which is very exciting. And I'm going there to try to um, implement this nurture, a culture of respect thing that we were discussing through the Prosody project. Uh, so we discussed that two years ago, and, and now the project is almost finished, and we still haven't done anything because to nurture a culture of respect. We need to engage with people, we need to meet, I need to meet thousands of people, I need to organize workshop and with the pandemic I can't do it. So it's a very, very tricky issue um, and complex issue. And I'll be, a, and with my background as an ecologist, I'm also a bit stuck there. And I'm very um, uh, happy about everything I hear and I'll happily explore the concept of social utility. Um, 
if you're ready to engage with me uh, within the next 10 days <laughs> because it's uh, it's it's very uh, close in time. So yeah, that's just uh, what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Chloe. So I, I want to dive a little deeper in this discussion on uh, the relationship of the indigenous peoples to nature, um, because um, we've had comments uh, underlining the fact the fact that this should maybe not be idealized completely, and uh, th the way Chloe um, uh, spoke of uh, the relationship of the people to elephants is a good example because um, uh, there are clearly tensions between the local people and the presence of elephants. And also it's interesting that um, all the reports here we've had from parks or protected areas in the West, they all describe huge tensions among the people who are there. And surely there are different ways of using nature and surely indigenous people don't all relate to nature in the same way and probably have their own tensions among themselves. Um, so how should we approach uh, these issues um, and how should we look at this problem? Please. Yes, I, 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 I agree that we cannot essentialize uh, uh, the relationships uh, that uh, all indigenous people have to nature and that we have to recognize, first of all, the diversity which is uh, existing among indigenous peoples. And uh, uh, we also have to recognize that uh, uh, indigenous peoples and, and us are all the same and that there are major issues of equity be be in, in, within their own societies, issues of power as, as well. And uh, that uh, most importantly, when they are facing uh, the, the value of money, uh, brought from outside, I mean, as a means of getting out of poverty, uh, they will obviously, I mean, sell their lands. That's what the, some uh, hunter-gatherers from Borneo did. Uh, the moment that the, the land was mapped <laughs> uh, to say that these were their customary lands and they sold their lands to, to logging companies. But then um, uh, there is some responsibility there also, and I don't know with whom this lies, as to, I mean, to what extent this, uh, uh, I mean, what you said before, I mean, uh, how they can benefit from being in this situation of, uh, I mean, a posteriori from this situation of poverty, which places them in a very, very vulnerable position, and and also uh, to what to what extent uh, loggers, companies, and so on should go into these lands and then create these situations of uh, complete, come uh, on, um, destructive uh, in, in terms of their own capacity to change, to, to suddenly wanting to get money and change and, and change life and, and so on. So, I mean, we haven't finished this, this reflection, but uh, yes, clearly uh, uh, it's, it's like, uh, uh, it's difficult to explain, but uh, they will uh, react as anybody else if their children are starving or or anything like that. And, and especially now with the global change and climate change and situations of, uh, uh, of uh, loss of, uh, of land. And uh, I think this is the case also in Europe because the ru rural Europe is, is becoming empty because uh, people don't, uh, are not able anymore to have uh, a non-industrial farm in rural Europe and, and the situation is the same. Yeah, go ahead, Ricardo. Yes, to say that um, I would like to say, well, indigenous is a colonial word already, but we are all indigenous. And I want to start with the Western roots of civilization. Uh, philosophy started as the physicist, and physics means nature. 
uh, Protagoras, Anaxagoras, Heraclitus, all our roots were in nature. So I, with the word humus and human, I want to invite to really consider the richness of each culture. Having said that, conflicts. The conflicts started in 1492 in all uh, in all fronts. Many of the Dominicans, two months after Columbus arrived, started to complain and defend. Prior to Bartolomé de las Casas, immediately, Montesinos uh, discoursed, this is ecocide, this is genocide. That is pre-modern, and that started in 1492 and 1493, it's recorded. Today, we need to recover philosophy because it provides a diversity of values. It provides a framework, a discourse. Is that sufficient? By no means. And having said that, knowing the roots of each culture provides a framework for intercultural dialogues. And in all cultures, we have conflicts and different attitudes. And Raphael was showing that here, but that's also with indigenous culture. One thing that is more complex today is the openness and exchanges of cultures. We work, and I have been working since 84 with indigenous communities in Latin America. We cannot address this problem in Chile and Latin America without dealing with narco. And narco has go through a Robin Hood, helping communities today to very, very complex situation of violence. So when dealing with the constitution in Chile and the Mapuche community, we cannot address the problems without addressing narco because you don't know where you are at the judicial system, at the indigenous community. So uh, there is conflict. And I would say it, to finish that we can somehow describe two barriers that are challenging for us. One is the physical barrier of becoming more urban, technological, and virtual societies, disconnected from the real flamingo, each of them, each family of flamingos having their own story and challenging us. Mm -hmm. That is not in the internet, because there they cannot be subjects, they are objects only. And that objectification is that what I call the physical barrier. And the other is the conceptual barrier. Science is are still dominated by this one-dimensional man criticized by Marcuse in the 60s, very quantitative, not taking with all the depths, the qualitative uh, breath we need to uh, transcend the numerical approach to understand this. And I would say that movimientos sin tierra, people in, for example, the peasant without land in Brazil, that are Pacific resistance movement, they bring together indigenous people, peasants, local people, people from liberation theology, <laughs> likes, scientists, anthropologists. So somehow that is the pluralism I think we are kind of trying to orchestrate here. So I would say let's orchestrate together with indigenous local communities. Of course, let's join the manifestations and have more voice for this great diversity that gives hope and the ground. Anyone else want to? Chloe, no? Okay. Um, so, obviously, uh, we have a few philosophers around this table, so we have s sort of philosophical questions coming. Um, one asks whether growth and progress ideology dates to the Bible or to the Enlightenment. So, um, is this just a myth among many? Um, a narrative, and how does it compare to the narratives of the indigenous people? Um, is it radically different? Does it have comparisons we can make? Does anyone want to bounce on that? <laughs> yeah, okay. I don't want to monopolize, but no. very briefly, I will try to be. We, we can find common elements and different elements. Um, Christianity is extremely diverse, and there are different interpretations of the Genesis. But I would say, as a contemporary expression of something that has deep roots, is the Laudate Si, encyclical by uh, Pope Francis. And 
The concept of creators has two meanings. <laughs> creators is created, but also um, upraised, uh, kind of educated, criar, the criare, also creado. The common thing here is a sense of kinship, because we're all creators. So we are creators, and that engage with many worldviews. The other worldview, generation, well, there are some pantheists within even the Christian tradition that are generated. And I would go there by, to David Hume that I was criticizing, now I would praise him, because he said, if we're all generated, we have a common ancestor. And now we discover this consciousness that evolved in the Cambric. Today, by neurobiologists and biochemists discovered that the neurotransmission of things that have to do with what we call anticipation, intentionality, consciousness evolved 450 million years ago in the Cambric. Therefore, it's not a romantic myth that the cricket, that the octopus, that the butterfly can have a consciousness. And that brings us to stories that have many fables, many myths, and that is one aspect. Second is the distinction between lineal and cyclical worldviews. And that was criticized by Lingua Jr. also in his foundational article, The, Ecological, the Historical Roots of Our Ecological Crisis. The cyclical view is very ecological. It's annual cycles, but it's also Buddhist and it's also in non-Western uh, Christianity like in Byzantium. So yes, progress is part of the problem, but it's deep-rooted in many traditions, and we could go to Confucius, we could go also to Marxism and capitalism as opposed to this circular notion, and I think we need more of this cyclical understanding of life that Heraclitus was already advocating and that uh, biochemists uh, today defend. So kinship, cyclical notions of life, and uh, interconnectedness, I would say, are in many traditions of thought within Western thought, uh, beyond, of course, and in sciences. The problem is that we are governed by a lineal system, numeric, and with that completely vertical that we're trying to break here, and for that we need the plurality of voices. Great thoughts. You want to add something? Yes, maybe from an anthropological perspective, it's, it's true that uh, there has been a lot of discourse on the fact that uh, in Europe, uh, um, um, there has been a division between nature and culture, but in, in a sense, it never happened really and totally. Yeah. Uh, so uh, basically, I mean, philosophers have been, uh, Les Mots et les Choses de Foucault, uh, showed very clearly that there has been a radical change from uh, analogical thinking to uh, a, a radical, you could say, rational type of thinking dividing humans from nature. but. First of all, this, this, this did not relate to all parts of the society. So most rural societies remained analogical uh, in a sense. And, uh, and also to say that today, I mean, the, this uh, um, classification of uh, all the societies in analogical, animist, and, and, and so on, I mean, more and more we, we know that all human beings integrate all of these systems in their way of relating to nature with different levels uh, of interaction. So basically, we are being told in, in some ways by our education that uh, we are different from nature, but profoundly we are not. Uh, uh, so it's, it's also a matter maybe today of, of reshaping the discourse about uh, the division between nature and culture, even in Europe because I don't think it really exists. Absolutely. Yeah, okay, Virginie. Uh, if I can add just a, a word about the, the second part of the question, which was, uh, uh, does it have to do with uh, Christianity or modern, sci modern science? And I think that, uh, indeed, for instance, the wonderful work of Karen Merchant have shown how uh, the conception of nature uh, is rich and complex, even in the Christian tradition. And if Christianity has 
done something like uh, separation or uh, exception of humanity, uh, the idea of nature and creatures remain for a long, long time um, a kind of um, a powerful uh, entity with autonomy, with agency, etc. And uh, the modern science program, which is not uh, completely um, uh, achieved in the real uh, people and real life situation, but the modern modernity program is uh, maybe much more than Christianity itself at the root of a certain conception of progress and of time linearity as the uh, domination of nature. And with Descartes and Bacon and uh, 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 other thinkers and scientists of this time, there is a total uh, equation between domination of nature, moral progress of humanity, scientific and technical progress. Uh, so I think there is a shift, not in the everyday uh, life or uh, in all the people and the peasants and uh, the witches and the, a lot of other people continue to have a much more complex and um, uh, intense relationship with nature. But this idea that with time, human will uh, uh, progress in the domination of nature and then in their moral, technical and scientific um, um, progress, I think it really is rooted in uh, modern science. Mm. Absolutely, thanks. So now I'll jump to something completely different. Uh, we've had a few remarks on urbanization. Um, and uh, someone pointed out that it implied loosening the link to humus, which is almost loosening the link to humanity, according to the way you shaped it. So uh, I don't know if we're becoming less human being in town, but uh, certainly uh, that, that has changed how our relationship uh, uh, to nature. How, how can we analyze that and how can we think about fixing that? Because we're, we're not going to go back from urbanization very soon. Um, we have to integrate that in the relationship of humanity to nature. And, and this is very true in parks, urban parks in France. I mean, we, we see that very much. They're being almost invaded by people who don't have the culture to act there, really. Any comments on that? So I'm, I'm not a, a designer or an architect, but I do believe that um, the design of the future, the design of urbanizations in the future will change dramatically and should be designed in such a way that systems, sustainable systems are created with new buildings. And we are starting to see that happen with, um, there's a competition around the world called the C40, a sustainable city competition, which is really interesting. It's taking old parts of cities that aren't used and asking people to come up with really creative, innovative systems designed with circularity where innovative hubs are created where people can live, where there's vertical agricultural farming, where there's concern about pollinators, where water is recycled. And I think the reality is we will be urbanizing, but we can design our, we can design our cities to take account of nature. And also, I don't know how it is uh, in other countries, but uh, in France, it's pretty striking that there's a thirst for nature that has resulted from the recent crisis, which is pretty staggering. I mean, people who live in the mountains say they've never seen an affluence like that, and it's actually gonna probably generate some management problems. Um, but, could that mean we are at a turning point or a civilizational turning point? Um, and here there is something that we have to learn to do. Uh, it's actually possible, maybe. Um, I yeah. Very briefly, three three concepts that might help the question to be huh. addressed. One, the concept of extinction of experience is a concept that has been coined originally by an entomologist, Robert Pyle. Uh, this 
lack of everyday experiencing encountering plants, insects, and flowers, and that has been expanded to what we have been talking, and that is the physical barrier of the urban system. Second, that lack of connection uh, with nature, biophilia in the psychoanalytic tradition, not so much in the E.O. Wilson tradition, but that we need that, and today the One Health concept, the forest path, in many places that we recover a, a psychological and a physical health. And finally, a call for a material ethics. And by material ethics, I mean an ethics that is embedded in the habitat and our bodies. Actually, the word spirit comes from breathing, comes from respiration. That's what means. So animal means anima, animated. And, and spirit allows that, that actual breathing that we have in the mitochondria. Today we know that we are an ecosystem of bacteria, viruses. We are a whole ecosystem, and that microbiome is breathing. And that is achieved through meditation, breathing, nourishment. So the reconnection with the bodies and ecofeminism are providing an very valuable theoretical and practical framework to reconnect with our bodies, which is to reconnect with the nature. Thanks. Uh, there's one last question I would like to uh, address very quickly since we're running out of time. Um, I know these are sort of rough transitions, but uh, it's the questions that uh, generate that. Um, somebody asked um, if we think we need a powerful international body for environmental justice um, and if that is what we need is this a reachable objective or is is there another way to do it maybe it's a question for you in priority thank you um, it's a good question and I think it's an important one to think about we um, <clears throat> recently at the Monaco Oceans Week we um, um, was, was speaking about creating a, a system like the IPCC, but for the ocean, to create a specific body of knowledge around ocean science and in particular to design frameworks. And I think it's one of the things that is required is that some kind of meta-governance, and there's a lot in the literature with, with Jessup, the work of Jessup, and um, many authors who have written about the, the need for some level of meta-governance. I think COVID has made the state, the role of the state, very important again. The state was sort of going a little bit out of fashion, but, but COVID has demonstrated how important state action is. But I think that there is a requirement for some kind of meta-governance system to create frameworks that, that can demonstrate social norms, because social norms are shifting, but law is too slow. The United Nations is too slow, it moves too slowly. So we need, I think it would be useful to have some kind of meta-governance structure to create frameworks like, for example, the FAO um, Sustainable Fisheries Framework is a very useful, practical tool which helps countries des design their governance systems to allow sustainable small-scale fisheries. So it's not an impossible thing to do at all, and I think it would be really helpful. Yeah. These will be the last... Oh, okay, I, I, I'd be short, but regarding the necessity of um, international organization for uh, environmental justice, I think that we should uh, first remark that some international organizations are actively, actively working against environmental justice. For instance, the World uh, Trade Organization, which uh, impeach any uh, state or community to have... Uh, uh, its own norms about. Uh, so I, I think at the uh, international level, we should first, not first, but we absolutely should focus on the antagonist uh, organization of the United States, uh, of the United Nations organization that are uh, active now. <laughs> uh, it's just about, and the UNESCO and also the TBD uh, have a lot of uh, resources to enforce environmental justice. Thank you so much. So uh, we've passed the time. Thank you very, very much to all the speakers for uh, their insights. This has been a wonderful session. It has opened uh, doors for thinking in many interesting directions. Um, I'm very happy with how it went. So thank you to all. Uh, thank you for your attention. 
and uh, we're back uh, for those that can at 2 p.m for a last round table about how we're going to do science and research in the new world that's beginning to unfold before our eyes thank you cette session de l'après-midi. Merci de vous installer. So welcome everybody um, for today's very last session. Um, thank you to all the brave people who've hung on until the end. So this part of the session will be in Two parts basically. 
we will first have um, two species, two speeches, sorry. <laughs> Too much biodiversity in three days. So we will have um, two short speeches by people we have invited who will also be at the UICN Congress. Um, one is Jessica Slattery, who is the officer responsible for environment, climate and energy issues at the US Embassy in Paris. And uh, the other one is the Minister of Culture and Environment of French Polynesia, Jeremoana uh, Mamatuai Autapu. I practiced. Um, so, without further ado, uh, I'll just give you the floor, Jessica. Okay. And uh, yeah, just there. And we're happy to hear you. Okay, merci. Bonjour. Is ça marche? Oui. Et uh, malheureusement, j'ai écrit en anglais. Elle a dit c'est uh, ok de parler en anglais, mais um, je trouve que tout le monde parle français et anglais parfaitement. Donc, uh, c'est peu importe. Um, as he said, my name is Jessica Slattery. I work at the U.S. Embassy in Paris, France, and I really am thrilled and honored to be here today to address you um, and to tell you a little bit more about what the Biden administration is doing on conservation, biodiversity, climate. As you may be aware, we've had quite the change in uh, administration and policy, so it's an opportunity to tell you a little bit about some of those um, significant changes that we're making in the United States. So when I was thinking about the theme of this panel, the place of conservation in the post-COVID world, my mind kept going back and forth between three challenges, emerging from the pandemic, of course, halting and reversing biodiversity loss, and, com and combating the climate crisis. So those three triple um, challenges that we face today. And it'd be really easy to just focus on all the devastation. We've seen a lot. But I'd like to take a moment instead and offer an optimistic perspective. The triple threat can also be a triple opportunity. But we know we have to act now to seize it. So this is exactly what the Biden administration and the G7 partners have been aiming to do with a comprehensive vision for a greener, more inclusive, and more resilient world. The pandemic and the devastating effects of climate change, extreme weather, ecosystem degradation have made it clear. Our health, our prosperity, and our future are all inextricably bound to the health of our planet. Nature is essential to the well-being of every family and every community across the world. So I'm sure you've heard it everywhere. I feel like I've been hearing it over and over this year. Governments talking about a green recovery. So what is that? Well, it means that the world should work to recover and rebuild from the pandemic while simultaneously working to address the climate crisis and to conserve, connect, and restore the lands, waters, and wildlife upon which we all depend. And these pursuits create opportunities. President Biden and Vice President Harris tried to mobilize right away our administration to confront the environmental challenges of our time and to harness opportunities that may come from it. On January 27th, President Biden signed executive order called Tackling the Climate Crisis at Home and Abroad. It launched an all-of-government effort, and I can tell you, we have a mission climate group. We are every interagency member is involved. This truly is an all-of-government effort and a powerful vision for the role that lands and waters can play in achieving climate goals. That he issued an ambitious domestic challenge conserving 30% of our lands and waters by the year 2030. I know you've heard about this elsewhere, 30 by 30. But this is the first ever national goal for stewardship of nature in the United States at this scale, ever. The 30% goal reflects the need to support conservation and restoration efforts across all lands and waters, not just public lands, including incentivizing voluntary stewardship efforts on private lands by supporting the efforts and visions of states and tribal nations. 
By conserving and restoring our planet, we can stem the extinction crisis, safeguard water and food supplies, absorb carbon pollution, and reduce the risks of future pandemics and other global health emergencies. So I acknowledge it's been very clear to me talking to some of you um, in the hallways here at lunch and during the coffee break that I am speaking to a room full of brilliant people, researchers, scientists, and you know better than me or anyone else how complicated our natural systems are and that, su that support human communities, particularly in the face of climate change. So for this reason, the administration is also doing a lot to address the climate crisis, including convening 40 world leaders for a summit in April and uh, uh, appointing the special presidential envoy for climate, John Kerry. We also recently committed to reducing emissions by 50% to 52% over the next 10 years. And we've got bold policies to back it up. We've pledged to triple adaptation finance for developing countries by 2024 and to work with other developed countries, the private sector, multilateral development banks, and others to achieve the goal of mobilizing $100 billion a year in climate finance. But no country or person or community can solve all of this alone. We know that. That's why the U.S. is working with other countries, um, including the G7 on, you may have heard, the Build Back Better World Initiative, B3 W initiative, and that aims to construct resilient infrastructure in the developing world that delivers basic services to communities. The U.S., together with our G7 partners, is proud of our values-based, high standard, and transparent model of development. So, to conclude, the B3W initiative includes a participatory consultations-driven engagement with civil society and communities to meet local needs. Plans like President Biden's climate and environment agenda and the G7B3W ensure that the triple priorities that we face don't need to compete for resources. In fact, they can be a triple opportunity. It is clear protecting biodiversity is vital for avoiding the next pandemic combating the climate crisis, but we need to learn from the pandemic and improve our responses and value nature as a central source of human well-being and environmental health in the post-COVID world. Nature's calling to us loud and clear. The message is unequivocal. Our planet is our health, it is our life, and it is our future. We have to act now to answer that call. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Jessica, for um, these insights into the policies of the Biden administration. Um, I think the environment will certainly need the help of the US to go through this crisis. Uh, now I'm going to uh, give the floor to the Minister of Environment, of, of Culture and Environment. <laughs> Uh, French Polynesia, um, for a perspective from that part of the world. Um, he has given me the choice of giving his speech in Tahitian or French, and uh, I said that we preferred French, so um, this is the language he will speak in. Thank you very much. Yorana? Um, <clears throat> vous remercie uh, de m'avoir invité uh, aujourd'hui pour échanger avec vous sur cette vision que nous avons, oh, pardon, oui, c'est vrai, euh, sur cette vie que nous allons avoir après le monde que l'on connaît aujourd'hui. Et euh, pour répondre à la problématique posée, je pense qu'il est d'abord nécessaire de définir ce que nous, en Polynésie française, on entend par un monde, un monde post-Covid. Je suis convaincu que pour les habitants des îles, nous savons ce que c'est de vivre des catastrophes climatiques. Notre mémoire collective nous le rappelle. Nous en avons subi quelques-unes et nous en subirons encore d'autres à l'avenir. Nous le savons. Lors de sa visite sur 
un atoll perdu de Tuamutu, l'atoll de Manhi, le président de la République a eu cette phrase très juste. Lorsqu'on parle ici des conséquences du réchauffement climatique et des dérèglements, on parle de vos vies, de la vie de vos enfants, on parle d'aujourd'hui. Il a en outre salué l'esprit de résistance des Polynésiens face aux aléas climatiques. Et cette crise sanitaire qui touche encore plus durement la Polynésie française actuellement a également montré l'importance de ce respect de la nature et des savoir-faire traditionnels. Par exemple, durant le confinement, on a vu beaucoup de pêcheurs donner le fruit de leur pêche aux familles n'ayant pas la possibilité de partir pêcher pour se nourrir. Cela a été encore le cas hier, où un pêcheur a offert un espadon de 200 kg aux familles de son district. C'est ce que l'on appelle chez nous « aroha », que l'on pourrait traduire par euh, « amour désintéressé », par « solidarité ». Ça n'a pas d'équivalent, en tout cas, en français. C'est difficile à expliquer. Pour nous, un monde post-Covid, c'est d'abord un monde à échelle humaine, euh, où les activités de l'homme respectent son environnement, euh, où euh, l'on privilégie les circuits courts, où l'on privilégie la culture et les diversités culturelles et le respect, où le respect et l'écoute de la nature deviennent des leviers du développement. Dans cette optique, nous avons lancé, par exemple, avant la crise d'ailleurs, le schéma directeur de l'agriculture avec le soutien d'organismes d'État, l'AFD par exemple, le CIRAD, l'IRAM, et mis en avant la nécessité pour la Polynésie d'atteindre son autonomie alimentaire autour d'axes forts, valoriser les pratiques agro-environnementales, placer la Polynésie dans le mouvement mondial du développement durable, mais surtout retrouver le lien, restaurer, je dirais, le lien qui unit l'homme à la terre. Avec 118 îles dans 84 atolls, soit seulement 4000 km² de, de terre, réparti sur une surface aussi vaste que l'Europe, c'est un véritable défi. Ensuite, nous avons aussi euh, lancé depuis quelques années euh, des projets de conservation euh, qui euh, sont au centre des préoccupations euh, aujourd'hui de la politique publique en Polynésie française. Au titre de mon ministère, par exemple, cela englobe une stratégie de gestion durable des espaces et des espèces dans le cadre euh, comment du patrimoine euh, commun de la Polynésie française, euh, une politique de protection et de préservation de la diversité linguistique, parce que si nous n'avons pas les mots pour dire les choses, ça n'a plus de sens. Euh, des axes aussi de protection des savoirs et savoir-faire euh, face à une globalisation des flux, des marchés, des cultures, et enfin, c'est avant tout euh, la volonté pour, pour nous de faire reconnaître le fait que nature et culture ne doivent pas être dissociées. Nous n'avons pas de terme chez nous pour dire la nature. On parle du monde. Donc nous avons été obligés de créer un terme pour parler de la nature et on a pris trois mots, la forêt, la mer et le ciel. Avec le changement climatique, la montée des eaux est une perspective qui nous angoisse tous dans le Pacifique. C'est une question qui nous prend au trip. L'Océanie est-elle condamnée à disparaître Mais au-delà des vagues menaçantes de l'océan Pacifique, la mondialisation qui avance inéluctable, 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 inéluctablement, pardon, je suis un peu troublé, pardon, ne va-t-elle pas engloutir en quelques décennies nos cultures, nos langues, nos histoires et nos paroles, avant même que nos îles ne disparaissent sous les flots. C'est peut-être aussi une question qui est encore plus urgente que la question de la montée des eaux. Si l'homme disparaît, qui, qui va protéger nos îles On parle souvent de... de de la disparition euh, comment, euh, des, euh, de, 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 des terres, des îles, mais il faut parler de la disparition du vivant. 
Dans la conception du monde occidental, l'homme supplante ce qui l'entoure. Dans la conception du monde polynésien, l'homme fait partie d'un tout et ne peut s'envisager sans son environnement. C'est pour cela qu'au niveau de la culture, par exemple, la Polynésie française porte aussi plusieurs dossiers à l'international. Ce ne sont pas que des dossiers culturels. Lorsque nous voulons faire inscrire l'archipel des îles Marquises en bien mixte nature et culture à l'UNESCO, c'est pour, comment dirais-je, mettre en lumière le lien intrinsèque entre l'homme et son environnement. C'est démontrer la capacité d'adaptation de l'homme dans un monde où la nature est respectée et la résilience d'un peuple qui a failli disparaître. C'est cela que nous voulons porter au regard du monde. Et la question que l'on peut se poser, c'est quelle est la place de la recherche dans tout cela ben, La réussite de tout ce que je viens de dire dépend justement de la recherche. Une recherche forte, dynamique, bienvenue bien sûr, qui doit être pluridisciplinaire, et je dirais même transdisciplinaire, et qui ne doit pas non plus mépriser les connaissances traditionnelles, bien au contraire. Et cela afin de répondre aux besoins de bien connaître, je dirais même de mieux connaître. On ne peut pas balayer d'un revers de la main des connaissances millénaires. Elles peuvent apporter un éclairage différent à la recherche. Cette recherche devra aussi être respectueuse des sensibilités et consciente des spécificités locales et régionales. Elle doit en fait enfin être centré sur les besoins et les intérêts propres des pays polynésiens ou du Pacifique. Je ne vais pas parler des autres. Donc, une recherche qui n'est pas là pour satisfaire le chercheur seulement ou satisfaire des intérêts autres, mais participer à la sauvegarde des, des populations, des cultures et de euh, nos petites îles. Parmi les... Les réformes réglementaires actuellement en cours que je mène, le gouvernement prévoit une, réforme, une réforme, pardon, du dispositif APA polynésien. Et le, texte, le projet de texte réaffirme la souveraineté de la Polynésie française sur ses ressources génétiques et sur les connaissances traditionnelles associées qui font partie du patrimoine commun de la collectivité. Fort de ces principes, nous sommes bien entendu prêts à accueillir toutes les équipes de recherche utile et nécessaire aux objectifs de connaissance développés au profit de la Polynésie française, de l'Océanie et de la France. Et je promets de lire l'ouvrage que l'on m'a offert sur cette thématique de l'APA pour faire en sorte que nous portions un texte novateur. C'est cela aussi le partage des connaissances entre savoir-faire traditionnel et la recherche. Je vous remercie. Merci, Monsieur le Ministre. Thank you for these words uh, of wisdom. Um, so here ends our, uh, in some way, political part of the session with our guests. I think uh, they have to actually. Uh, today is a very complicated day logistically because um, of the presence of so many important people in Marseille. So I think um, we're going to let you leave us, and uh, we're going to continue among scientists, this discussion on how to do research in a post-COVID world, uh, which Franck Courchamp has prepared for us. Thank you. Uh, very moving yes. speech. So we, we're going to uh, go on uh, with the, the, the debate, uh, per se. Uh, we're going to uh, welcome uh, three people uh, for, the, for, the, for the debate. Uh, the first one is Vincent de Victor, who works uh, in, in Montpellier, who will be uh, online. Uh, the second one is uh, Alok Bank, who is uh, in India. He is going also to be online. The third one is uh, Ildiz, who, met, uh, Didi, who uh, is uh, here and will join us uh, uh, at the table. And uh, even though I have a, a fourth name here, uh, unfortunately, uh, Laetitia uh, Hedouin, who had um, agreed to come uh, with us, uh, has been called, her expertise has been called elsewhere uh, urgently, so she's just leaving the room uh, right now. So, so there'll be on, only the three of us, the three of them, sorry. Um, so, uh, hi Alok, I, I can see that you are connected uh, already. Thank you very much for uh, uh, accept, accepting to be, uh, to be here. 
Um, so um, we will have a very short uh, opening thought, uh, thoughts by uh, both uh, Vincent and then by, by Alok, like about five minutes uh, more, more or less each to set the, the debate. And during this time, I invite you all to uh, ask your questions on the platform. You can, you can see here on, on this slide uh, how, how to do it. It's very easy. Uh, the only uh, drawback is that it's a short question, uh, only uh, 160 characters, but you are used to it. If you are using uh, Twitter, uh, you have to be concise. We will have more characters to answer your, your questions. Um, so um, one of the reasons why I have invited both uh, Vincent and, and Alok is that they have already thought uh, a bit about this, this question. They have both uh, participated to uh, publications on, on this th uh, theme. Um, there are other publications. There are actually quite, quite a lot of uh, thought in the community about um, conservation research in a, in a post-COVID world. Um, I, I have put here uh, a few, a few uh, thoughts so that perhaps it will trigger uh, some, some questions. Uh, I will not go uh, through them uh, all. I'm, I'm inviting you to, to read them. Uh, mostly I will not go through them because I cannot see very well from here um, <laughs> what, what, what is written. But uh, if, if you read quickly the, the, the yellow part, you will see that there are uh, thoughts on very different levels, uh, very practical ones, uh, more philosophical ones, uh, and they are uh, both positive and, and negative. And uh, I'd like you to um, think about, about your own perspective on that and what, what, it, what you think it will mean for, for uh, research uh, in, in the post-COVID world. Then I have put uh, half a dozen quick questions here uh, also to, to trigger some, some reflection from you and perhaps to have some some uh, other questions from, from you. Uh, and, and these go from, for example, has trust in science been affected by uh, this situation where we have seen that science has been uh, unable to give clear answers or to, to give fixed answers to the, to the public. And this has been uh, an issue for, for the public who is not used to science not always agreeing uh, with itself. Uh, but on the other hand, perhaps uh, the fact that People have predicted uh, pandemics, and we have seen this uh, in, in the talk of Serge Morand uh, yesterday night. Um, perhaps this will uh, reinforce the trust in, in scientists. Uh, we, we can also uh, ask whether um, the, the, the connection with biodiversity is, is going to be uh, more felt or more realized by, uh, by, by people. Um, we, we can wonder whether we scientists, uh, researchers, uh, are enough engaged uh, globally, and, and Vincent is going to talk a bit uh, about that. Um, the, the, um, the lockdown period has been, and the COVID period has been very tough on, on students, uh, and we can wonder whether their career path and their opportunities and their prospects are going to be different from this, this court to the, the next or to the previous one. Uh, are we ourselves uh, planning on changing our ways to do research? Are we committed to, to, to make the changes that, that we think we need to do? And what are those changes? And, and uh, eventually, uh, perhaps also most importantly, uh, will we be soon or will we be ever in a post-COVID world? And uh, on this, I will uh, leave the, the, the floor to, to first Vincent and then to Alok for th some uh, preliminary thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. And actually, I would like to broaden the questions asked to the issue of global warming, which, which is also a very important issue for research today. And uh, so it's both a COVID world rather than a post-COVID world, which is awaiting for us, and a warming world. So thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Very well, yes. Yeah, OK. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for making this uh, stimulating conference uh, possible in spite of uh, difficult conditions. I wish I could be in the room, but uh, I could uh, catch up with most of the previous talks. So it was very nice also to, can, uh, to access to this conference online. Thank you very much. And thanks, Frank, for making this uh, very nice overview and introduction. So yes, I wanted to add um, an overlooked aspect to the discussion by asking again if we are going back to this uh, business as usual, as it seems to be the case in uh, very impactful societies, 
should I go back to research as usual? Okay, so that's my question. And I think there is a domain in which we could spend some more time and more energy. It's the domain of advocacy, commitment, engagement, however we call it, taking the risk of unusual research and action. Because after all, what is the point in documenting in ever greater detail by liberty loss if we don't commit more to fight against the causes of this loss? Maybe you also had this uh, feeling that research and scientists before the pandemic were already engaging in uh, original um, position in current political agendas. I have in mind the, the researchers in ecology evolution, but in many fields also, that have accumulated warnings to society, but also created new initiatives, quite unusual initiatives, such as uh, scientist rebellion, calling for climate revolution. It was quite uh, interesting to me to find this kind of initiatives. We are not very used to that, right? And their agenda, I think, is very simple. They call to uh, less publication, for more public action. And for example, currently, while I'm talking, some of them are occupying uh, the scientific museum in London to protest against an exhibition funded by oil companies that try to promote new technologies to capture uh, carbon of the atmosphere with ignoring most of their results and numbers on climate change impacts and consequences. So of course, we might not all share um, what they are doing and how we can be more engaged in, in this kind of, uh, of fight. But I think it makes the point very clearly that there is an increasing embarrassing mood um, in scientists, but also in non-academics people, that there is a, a divorce or some kind of mismatch between what we know and what we do, or what political are uh, trying to do, or what they ignore. Um, even more classical institutions uh, like the IPBS are also calling for, I quote, a fundamental system-wide reorganization. So that's very strong across technological, economic, and social factors, which include paradigm shifts, goals, and values. And they add that they anticipate strong, strong opposition or to these uh, transformative changes from those that is, for which interests are more in the statu quo, of course. So it's not a peaceful situation, I would say, and uh, Virginia also previously underlined that. We need to find new way of fighting. So this is uh, one of the points I would like to make. Even among conservationists, I mean, we have had, can you hear me? Still one. We have had a pro-growth uh, narrative. Okay, so it's not as if we all share the same views and that we all have we don't have enemies within the conservationists, of course. So here is probably a source of conservation conflict that I would like to, to make and that the pandemic will probably reveal even more. The so traditional division between knowledge production and decision making is not working. It's not linear, it's not mechanical. Okay, so can we afford to just sit and wait? We will probably have to face new and unexpected sorts of fights for biodiversity uh, values and environmental justice. And are we ready for that? So to take one of the Frank's question, are we as scientists globally enough engaged? And I think we are not. But I would add that are we ready for that? And I still think that we are not. Probably because we are not really used to focus on what causes biodiversity loss that much. I mean, we do focus on the relationships between pressures and responses. But what about those pressures? What are their origin, their history, their democratic foundation? So if the goal is to end destructive forms of domination over our nature and over some people, we should probably identify more clearly deleterious politics, but also people, companies, advertising industries, industries creating doubts, lies, and just fight against them. So it has turned to, to concrete actions already, but mostly from journalists and NGOs. And there is no reason, I think, why we should not get more involved into those fights. Fighters against those big useless projects are more and more visible, by the way. I have in mind the mapping and listing of what they call big useless projects that is already available. Um, and it's a new form of resistance. I mean, 
they, they don't correspond to higher class or uh, just hippies, you know, having romantic views of protecting nature. It's also a form of resistance that is uh, carried and needed by uh, lower class people and by very diverse communities. As Ricardo also emphasized, there is an ecology of the poor. We cannot just say, well, the rich cannot say anything about those fights. Okay, it's, it's a real uh, movement. So as a conclusion, I think that some of the tension, I guess, I wanted to highlight is a call for uh, probably more public action and not just publication, right? It's uh, uh, slightly that is going to be more and more uh, debated in the forthcoming months and years. And that I think we are not prepared for that, so that it's a call to be more prepared within the research teams and labs. And maybe a first step is to consider that conservation conflicts are not all necessarily bad. Some of them are telling something uh, profound and strong about the, the situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vincent. That was very uh, enlightening. Um, it's issues that we've touched upon already, but um, they're very important and it's good um, that we have them before us. Alok, would you like uh, to make uh, your introduction right now? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, it's perfect. Go ahead. Great. First of all, thank you, Frank and Yves, for inviting me. I'm joining you from India, and uh, <clears throat> I think this is one of the most creative ways of that we have learned, especially during pandemic, how to have conferences and meetings, even without physically being present. Uh, I think I've been following the event for the last two days, and uh, uh, what a great lineup of speakers, uh, their thoughts, their insights. And I think it's a great kickstart for the IUCN Congress. So coming to the topic, which is the place of research and conservation in the post-COVID world, I will broadly divide my, um, my realizations into positives and negatives, and then maybe we could take up question and answers, and I could elaborate on some of the research questions that one can take up or even the solutions one can think of. Um, I think even before coming to the professional thing, one would like to address this as a person, as an individual. And I think although the tragedy is huge uh, surrounding COVID-19, the positive thing is that it is now personal for all of us. We have in our wider or closer circles uh, have <clears throat> lost friends, family, colleagues. Some of them came back, some of them succumbed to it. Uh, and I think that makes it not just a professional or an academic inquiry. Uh, conservation of biodiversity is now a very personal inquiry for all of us, for many of us. And I think that personal touch will bring more clarity, more determination, more willpower for all of us who are engaged in this science. Uh, I think what is forgotten in um, the onslaught of COVID is that although it is a health uh, crisis, uh, the roots of this health crisis, this global health crisis, actually lies in the environment. It is an environment-born tragedy. Um, it has probably happened because we uh, interfered with processes that were shaped over millennia. Uh, and maybe this uh, tragedy was avoidable. So I think with that context and gravity, I believe uh, if we keep that in uh, at the back of our mind or at the forefront of our minds, I believe the biodiversity science will be greatly enriched. Uh, coming to the second positive um, uh, realization, I think <clears throat> science teaches us to be skeptics of absolutist uh, statements. And um, I think we all, um, with sometimes with more knowledge, also comes more skepticism. But I think the positive realization regarding COVID-19 has been how quickly some of the environmental variables have jumped back to normal. So within weeks, pollution levels dropped. Within uh, a few weeks, uh, wildlife started being sighted in the bank center of urbanization. And maybe these are shallow indicators. Maybe uh, environmental indicators are still uh, degrading. Not maybe, they are getting degraded. But at least at the shallow level, there is a rapidity with which uh, certain environmental variables have jumped back to normalcy. And that, I think, fills me and, I guess, broader um, fraternity with positivity. Uh, <clears throat> I believe that this positivity will uh, serve as a big push towards conservation of habitats and species, and that it's not all a gone cause, and that certain changes in our behavior, even if extreme, uh, they may bring us back from the, uh, from the brink of disaster. Um, I think the third positive realization, and um, one needs to work on it as conservationists and scientists, one needs to work on it, 
um, is the realization that we have new allies in this fight now. We have healthcare professionals, we have epidemiologists, we have citizens, we have corporations, all of whom are basically demanding for a cleaner, for a safer environment. And I think it is in our benefit, one should not be an opportunist, but it is in our benefit and benefit of the planet if we realize uh, that we will have new allies. <clears throat> Along with this positive realization, I think there are uh, many negative realizations. We are realizing more and more that uh, in the process of giving impetus to the economy, uh, the environment is the first uh, and the biggest casualty. Environmental norms are being flouted, uh, officially deregulated, and examples regarding these come from all over the planet. Uh, I am from India, and I can give you personal examples of how environmental deregulations have led to uh, the number of projects, industrial projects that get clearance from the environmental ministry that has jumped to twice the number of uh, projects getting cleared in an average year. In Brazil, there are about 25 to 30 uh, laws, acts being passed by the Brazilian parliament, which will deregulate the environmental norms to, and these, uh, the issues uh, under these laws, they range from toxicology of pesticides to GMOs, to uh, environmental fines divide on industries, to deforestation, so on and so forth. <clears throat> The um, US embassy um, representative was here and she presented a very positive picture. But let me tell you, the US was no different as compared to the developing economy. De-escalation of emission norms happened in the US. Um, many uh, protected areas uh, were open to commercial activities. Uh, fishing was allowed in marine protected areas, so on and so forth. And Indonesia deregulation of norms on timber for exporting uh, happened. And this is the story of um, um, not just tropical and biodiversity rich countries. This is the story from all over the globe. Uh, and I think uh, it would be a miss if we think that this is, a, a, this is a characteristic of the current pandemic. No, this is what we observe after every single of the global crisis that have happened in the last five decades. So the last uh, major uh, global crisis was the financial crisis of 2008 and 9. And in the recovery period from the financial crisis, we saw um, the greenhouse gas emissions shooting out of the roof. Um, this would be probably uh, a similar case uh, on our road to uh, recovery from COVID-19. We will see similar kind of processes, similar kind of things are already happening. And uh, as we all of know, as researchers in this field, we know that uh, environmental indicators take longer to recover than, um, than economic indicators. Uh, so that is one of the negative realizations that one needs to work on. Uh, <clears throat> I would uh, like to focus on uh, the human resource aspect uh, that is engaged in research. Um, I think research becomes smoother not only because of um, researchers sitting in laboratories and universities and institutes, it becomes smooth because of grassroots personnel, grassroots organizations. Um, it becomes smooth because of administration, management personnel, et cetera, so on and so forth. Many of these personnel, because of young researchers, early career researchers, uh, and many of these um, personnel will be bearing the brunt of the uncertainty surrounding the, um, surrounding the pandemic. So I think um, as research community, we need to strengthen, we need to empower. We need to foster interconnections that would help these uh, vulnerable uh, parts of our fraternity to, uh, to strengthen. And um, yeah, and I think the third um, most important part in any research activity is the money that we need to do research. And we are seeing that there's an immense funding crunch. Um, of course, that was expected because money was being diverted to more immediate concerns. But um, there is as much as, um, uh, I think 60 to 90% decrease in the funding to um, conservation projects, if I'm not wrong. And um, Charities Aid Foundation in America uh, recently, uh, uh, recently carried out a study in which they found out that 93% of the conservation NGOs worldwide have reported saying that the pandemic has negatively affected them. And 38% of these NGOs may not be viable for the next fiscal year. So that is the state of uh, funding and the viability of many of the players in this field. So I think that is another, um, uh, another area which needs uh, more strengthening. I will briefly touch on the research questions. I think one of the most uh, um, interesting research questions, although the tragedy is immense, I think it will be a miss as a researcher 
if we do not um, if we will not be interested in understanding how is the anthropos how is the lockdown how is the pandemic and the post pandemic recovery how are all these phases uh, unraveling and how are they affecting the biodiversity uh, so i think that uh, would be one of the research questions to uh, and in fact that is an umbrella of questions it has so many questions under in, underneath and um, so that would be one question. The second uh, question, the more specific questions would be to look at uh, what are the effects of uh, the ban on wildlife trade in Southeast Asia? Uh, it of course can have positive as well as negative impacts as many of the environmental factors do. Um, ban of course would result in less wildlife trade and maybe then more barriers between the humans and wildlife, but it may also result in more uh, job losses, more poverty, and hence more dependence of people on environmental factors. So one has to unravel these, uh, these processes much more. Um, habitat destruction, the question of that needs to be investigated. Um, I read recently that about 60 to 136% increase in deforestation has happened in Asia Pacific, uh, Africa and uh, South American regions. So again, that is one of the aspects uh, that needs to be studied much more in detail. Um, and I think there is a huge scope for anthropological and social questions related to the perception of natural and uh, people's uh, natural and wildlife, uh, how they're perceived by people. So green spaces, especially in urban areas, uh, they could be much more appreciated now than before. But uh, for example, is the skepticism and doubt towards wildlife as carriers of diseases, has that increased? Questions like these, for example, which look at the comprehensive point of view uh, regarding COVID need to be uh, taken up. Um, this is my opening address. We can discuss about solutions, but I would like to touch upon very briefly upon what uh, Vincent very, has- uh, Alok, very briefly, please. <laughs> yeah, uh, what my previous speaker said. I think um, um, the scientific community needs to engage much more. Uh, with uh, general public, with policymakers, and that is the way ahead, without which one cannot sit in one's ivory towers and hope for things to change. Thank you very much. Thank you to both. Um, Ildiz, you, you want to say a few preliminary words on the issue, and then we, we really kick off the debate? Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me um, again at the round table. <laughs> Um, it's very nice to, to meet you both uh, through the online vir virtual system. Um, uh, about the COVID, I would like to say something. In fact, when there was the first lockdown, uh, we were locked down in cities, of course, and, uh, and uh, suddenly we, we didn't have much uh, connections with nature, and this has been said before. I think uh, maybe what COVID brought to lots of cities, city people is that uh, their immense necessity to link and to be connected to nature. So I hope uh, that there will be research on this uh, absolute necessity to be connected to nature. Uh, uh, so one way, in fact, as mothers, for instance, uh, uh, to connect to nature in cities is what we eat because we eat uh, substantial biological products and as you know in France we say and also in Germany I think can't say that we are what we eat and during the COVID everybody tried in in his house to make the best food possible because we were in a period of crisis and and this made me think because I had time to think for the first time at home without the pressure of uh, being at, at work uh, but, but what will become of the world if most of us are in the cities? And uh, we will depend on food, but where will this food come from? And, and there's a huge area, and I think we have to engage in these priorities too. There's a huge area about what we will eat, where will it be grown, uh, what it means to have um, peri-urban agriculture, and what opportunities this uh, represents for, uh, for young people, uh, because there's also a question about what young people would like to do. And, and there are, I think it's our role and responsibility to draw also from the COVID some of the major themes that could be the, 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 the real themes in which the young uh, generation of our students would identify themselves as a, a good priority for them, either to continue research or to be engaged researchers. 
So uh, responding to, to uh, Vincent also, I, I had called for full engagement and I think uh, we have to shift uh, radically in that sense and not only, I mean, in terms of action. I think we have to keep our identity of researchers because uh, it's just the way we do research, I think, which could change by being more involved because uh, the solutions, for me at least, comes from uh, co-constructing research agendas and questions based on local realities and, uh, and bridging uh, with uh, a plurality of uh, knowledge systems to find solutions. I don't think we have found the solutions for uh, at territorial levels. And I also don't think the researchers have been sufficiently involved with the diversity of stakeholders at the territorial levels so that their research is sort of immediately taken up, uh, I mean, without waiting for our papers to come out by different people according to their different perspectives of what they can get of, of joint research, in fact, uh, activities. And I don't think as that as a researcher, I, I can simply give up uh, research and do only advocacy and, and actions. Although I am, I, I think I have to be fully involved in advocacy. Uh, but uh, I think Francois said that earlier, I mean, the, the, the solutions will come from the ground and we have to be there also and not just speak because our voice is only one among other voices. So this is uh, mainly what uh, I think we, we, we still have a role in research, but we have to redesign the way we do research and, and with whom and how to disperse the, the, the results uh, much more quickly or discuss the results much more quickly. So, so there's been a lot of deep questions being asked in, in these three talks. Uh, I'm curious if people in the room want to jump on that at some point. Um, even for a short comment, yeah, I, I saw that you were nodding, Francois. Um. Yes, just to jump on your point, uh, <laughs> Yeah, being myself uh, in, engaged for many years in uh, action, uh, uh, and I'm also uh, grateful to scientists 30 years ago which started the program. So I, I think today there are different ways of engagement, and uh, policy is one, and enter into politics uh, and have a policy engagement. Now it seems that. Uh, uh, conflict is a, a way of doing policy today. Uh, and then this is the kind of uh, fighter attitude that uh, uh, Victor was, uh, uh, we have to have a, a loud voice uh, and then uh, not fear to be a kind of fighter attitude. But when you come to a local action with actors, and I'm working also with what we call uh, uh, forest area charters uh, where everybody is around the table, uh, uh, friends and enemies, let's say, but they all share the same territory. Then the, the fighter attitude is no more constructive. And so we must really uh, have different types of engagements and adapt the attitude to uh, the effectiveness of the result. And uh, yeah, so one is. Uh, not fear to be a fighter, but when you come to co-construction, the fighter attitude is not the right one, I think. So, what, other, other reactions from the room? Um, one of the things I, was, I wanted to put forward to our speakers, or hear them on, is that um, uh, in recent months, I've heard scientists say, um, um, doing good science is more conflictual now. Uh, I mean, of course, we've seen that with the pandemic, as uh, you know, there, there have been uh, all, all these debates on public health measures, and people who, for example, uh, supported vaccinations got attacked, uh, sometimes very viciously. Um, but you can see that in the field of environment, too. I mean, scientists who speak up for the environment also receive stronger attacks, I, my impression is, than it used to be before. Uh, so maybe maybe these are new times um, 
for science, at least environmental sciences and, and, and maybe others too, in a more conflictual world. Uh, how do you feel about this particular problem? Anyone? <laughs> Well, you think it's a true problem, or, or is it just an artifact of perception? I think, well, can I say something, maybe? Of course. Yeah, <laughs> yeah okay. Awesome. So, well, um, when I started to think about that, I realized that, um, I mean, conflict is perceived as something wrong, you know? It's, it's harmful, of course, it's, it's not comfortable, it's risky, but it's, it's out there. And maybe one of the uh, myths we have constructed and co-constructed by some of the people that we should fight against uh, is that a, a consensus is always possible. I mean, it, very often conservation action is conflict by definition. And it's okay. I mean, it's, it's showing something very interesting. Do we want to build a new supermarket or to keep this area? This is absolutely a conflict. You, you can sit around the table with, how, how many people are whatever you want, but it's conflictual by definition because you act as a destruction. And a destruction is an action that will bring controversies and conflict. So you can ignore that and try to say that it will, it will be okay with sustainable development and harmony and you know, abstract things, or, or go into local things and, and see that what is a conflict, for whom, and what, what are the power relationships. Power relationships are often conflictual, but that's okay, that's interesting. And as researchers, I think that's where we have a role to play also. It's, it's being also able to, to see and identify uh, the misunderstandings and to make those conflicts more explicit instead of hiding that. Can I say something? Of course. Yeah, I think that uh, the first, um, um, reaction is that you can have conflict only when you're relevant. So I guess if scientists are facing or environmental scientists are facing more uh, conflict and wrath from public or policymakers, it is, I think, I think it is good because that means you are saying something relevant and you are putting forth your stand, which probably was absent earlier. And second, I think, um, is that um, maybe uh, conservation actions are conflict oriented, but I think you should be ready for, um, for consensus and be prepared for conflict. I think that is the way to go ahead so that in case there is a positive action uh, waiting to be unearthed, uh, unraveled, then there is a possibility to, to explore that. But in absence of that, in, uh, in things that are done in surreptitious manner or clandestine manner or outright attacks, then I think you have to be prepared for the worst. Great. Um, more comments in the room? Yeah. Uh, thanks. Um, some, some, yeah, maybe. some help and some that were, were explaining that uh, okay, it, we need conflicts to to solve the problems and to solve the yeah to solve the crisis, which which is okay. But I think that we have we will have more and more conflicts also because uh, the stakes are higher and higher. We're going deeper into the crisis and. Uh, I'm afraid we will have more conflict just because we're going deeper into the crisis and we will um, miss biodiversity resources and there will be conflicts around that, probably. And do you think, do you think the community is ready for that? No. <laughs> no, I, I, I was talking about that with different people in, in the Congress. Mm. What, what I'm always afraid about is, is okay, we, we're going to, to we will have catastrophes with the climate and with uh, losses of biodiversity, needs for, for um, water. Um, but what I'm afraid about, about, I mean, is about the reaction of societies. Mm -hmm. I mean, because of course we, we try to, to react the best we can and some societies, I mean, there, there are good way for which societies can react, but we, we already see that there are many bad ways like wars, uh, very violent conflicts. And of course, I'm uh, hoping for uh, finding other way to solve the conflicts. But I always, I, I don't know any, I mean, I'm not working on human societies. I'm just a um, simple uh, ecologist. Um, but then I, I see human um, um, 
human systems uh, as so complex with so many layers um, that I don't really clearly uh, see good solutions. <laughs> Yes, I just wanted to make a, a difference between conflict and confrontation. And uh, yes, we have conflicts, but uh, if we ca can have people come to the table, then it becomes a confrontation. And then it's the door open to, to maybe not a consensus, but maybe trade-offs, but uh, at least something constructive. So um, I think our role is to foster the um, to foster moving from the conflictual attitude and which is in fact uh, refusing to exchange with diverging opinions and moving this to confrontation where we as an actor of the discussion can bring some depassionate uh, views. It's an interesting discussion whether science should be depassionate or not. Um, can I add yeah, a no, no, but uh, it's arguable, yeah, absolutely. Can... Yeah, go on, yeah. Vincent, yeah. Okay, so um, maybe a, a practical way to start is to, to go for history of those conflicts. I mean, they are absolutely not new. If you go back to the many conflicts that have uh, structure the history of environmental battles. You will find enemies, allies, cheats, strategy, tactics, and this is where I have started, just to study how it goes. I mean, it, it's not just refusing to go on the table, it's also to understand who are those that will uh, sell doubts, create lies, uh, and about the, the violence, just we need the definition of what is violent or not. Some of those very big useless projects are very violent socially and for nature. Uh, so it's not about just protesting and being a street fighter, you know, and I'm not a street fighter. <laughs> and I'm not very good at public action, by the way, but just studying in history, what has happened is already a very good start to realize that, I mean, it's not going to be okay just by sitting around and discussing. Oui, merci. Je suis sûr. Oh, sorry. Do I take it to Russia? Yeah, uh, sorry. Just to, to jump on that point, maybe you raise a point uh, with these uh, big useless projects. Uh, and I think maybe there is an issue on scale uh, that's uh, local scale uh, innovative actions, innovation actions. They, they, they work based on this, but then there is this uh, big useless project, uh, as you say, which have actually are at a higher scale that, than human scale, I would say, but have a high global impact. And many uh, local scale innovation actions that can result from these uh, co-construction process, they can be effective if there are many, but one single uh, big useless uh, project can be uh, detrimental in one shot, I would say. So the, the, the main issue are these uh, big scale, uh, large scale projects, uh, big users projects, as you say. And the, the co-construction is more local, probably. Mm -hmm. Yildiz, you yes, this, this relates to, it's the same subject, in fact, but uh, uh, to the fact that decision making in environment in general now is taken, uh, I mean, decisions are taken at a global level. And uh, my question is also how this will dilute or not dilute or, or be fine-tuned across the different scales to the regional and to the local level. So at the local level, if I take, for instance, the, the objective of IUCN of having 30% uh, of protected areas, how will this be I mean, effectively discussed at a, a local level is a very important issue today, and I will be following that at the IUCN, because we know that even regarding protected protected areas, there has been a lot of uh, violence uh, regarding uh, 
uh, people living in these areas or using these areas. So how will this be considered from now on? So is this an issue where we will, there will be a conflict or where we will be sitting around a table looking at the point of views of the different uh, stakeholders? Th this is a major issue. Of course, there are directions at IUCN now to have different types of protected areas and so on. But this has been an area of, of high violence. So, so I just wanted to point out that, uh, yeah, there is, there is a need to, to discussion and accepting uh, consensus and, and sharing views and finding something which is uh, valid for different users. How new is this, Yildiz? I mean, um, are we discussing uh, something that's in connection with COVID or... you meaning or the violence? Or? Yeah. Oh, the violence started with uh, Yellowstone. It's right. the first national park which evicted all the Amerindians uh, to create uh, what was then considered to be uh, the wilderness uh, and which was followed by the Wilderness Act in America, which is a vision of, of nature, of course, but uh, we, which automatically, I mean, disconsidered the presence of humans. So it's, it, it goes back to the, the first establishment of national parks. And uh, if you look at Yellowstone or any of other of these uh, huge uh, uh, American parks, uh, they lack people inside, and there are, and at the same time, they are full of tourists. But so, so uh, it, it's it's uh, it's paradoxical for me because uh, it started with uh, with uh, violence. Yes, it's true, and. Uh, of course, it continued, and it continues because uh, I did my thesis in Indonesia in one of the biggest national parks in Indonesia, and it was a situation of violence, uh, true violence. So in, in this general situation of different crises um, unfolding in parallel, uh, somebody asks, uh, there are a lot of papers released as scientists warning on dot, 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 um, and uh, that question points out that scientists warn a lot, but then nothing much happens. Is there a way for scientists to speak up? And we, we, we touched upon this issue yesterday, but still, it, it is a big issue. Um, how can we make the messages of science more audible and more heard? Um, should we just change the adjectives that we use uh, in the papers that we write? Or should we use other ways of communicating? And I say we, but I mean you. So, so I think that those, those papers were very interesting, even in, uh, in the epistemological way of thinking about how to uh, make science and to, to use scientific uh, rhetoric. Because the impact was actually huge, but in the media or social media, and very brief. So it was, so for, from uh, the, the media perspective, it was huge. We had many papers talking about that paper again. Then I think it was almost uh, nothing or very weak to policymakers, and it, were, it was probably zero on the ground in, in biodiversity conservation. So it depends on what we mean by impact. But the, the, the thing is that it had make a benchmark or a sign that there is this community out there that says we know enough. We know enough about climate change. We know enough about the causes of biodiversity enough. So we, 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 do, we cannot pretend that we don't know enough about the, 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 the extent uh, and the, the, the causes. So that, that's a point that should have been made. Maybe what has been missed by those papers is that they have talked about humanity in general. You know, it was kind of a grandiose call to humanity, which is absolutely meaningless because there is no humanity. You have societies with their own problems and cultures and history. So we, we are not sure about what is, what is this humanity about. Um, but the other point is that some of those papers were just summarizing things that have been repeated already in the past uh, five decades. So that's, 
I mean, that's, that's the situation we are facing now, is that do, do we need to, to wait until we accumulate even more uh, facts and evidences? Or can we just open the door? When I, I say taking more action for less public action, it can be one day every two weeks within the team or research lab where we think about what we do uh, beyond just publication, you know, to think about uh, other actions. And it can be concrete action, but it can be dealing with art, uh, whatever, but just research as unusual, unusual research. Wolfgang uh, yesterday was saying to me in a private discussion that uh, they had joked about uh, going on strike at the IPCC, like saying we're not going to produce any more reports until you do something. Um, and uh, it was a joke, uh, but when you think about it deeply, um, doing more and more reports is a way of saying this supplemental knowledge is useful. Um, and, and it's, you know, at the same time, we have the data, we, sh we should ask, we, we should act now. So, uh, isn't there a contradiction, in fact, in being a scientist? Being a scientist is just saying that we need to produce more knowledge. And uh, at the same time, here we're running into some issues where we have enough knowledge, basically. So, um, uh, can I say something? Yeah, of course. This? I think um, the uh, biggest problem comes when we treat scientific fraternity as a monolith. They're, these are individuals, they have their own um, specific likings, interests, agendas. Uh, and um, many of us will keep on doing what we are good at, which is probably and what we are rewarded for. And so the majority of people will probably keep on doing what they have been doing. But I think uh, the problem is when a select few of us, which who may have different interests, are not rewarded accordingly. So for example, uh, for a researcher, for a person working in a university, it is assumed that, for example, 80% or 90% of their time will go in a specific duty and 10% of it will probably go to administrative duties or university-centric duties. Why does an ecologist does not have the freedom to choose a part of their tenured time, of their office time, to give to something else? As Monson said, that one day in two weeks. Why not one month in a year that I give specifically for something that I'm interested in? That may include seeing the ground reality, the grassroots work that I'm propagating through my research journals. But unfortunately, a very few select group is reading that. It is not reaching the vast majority of people. So how about giving that freedom? And that uh, problem is magnified for young researchers who are not tenured. Unfortunately, the hiring committees, the funding committees do not look upon that as an advantage. In fact, they look upon that as a disadvantage. And I think um, if uh, the hiring committees, the funding committees become much more flexible, much more comprehensive in how they evaluate candidates, I think that would somehow um, make the conservation, the future of conservation thrive, even in universities and research, research domain. Yeah. That's a great point. Um, it's actually a good transition to discuss um, how you think scientific institutions should sort of change the way we do research uh, in, in this new world that we're arriving in. So for example, there are discussions about traveling less or traveling only when it's necessary. Um, and somebody actually suggested on the chat that a student career could start with a one-year conservation restoration service, like, you know, not military service, but conservation service, um, which would be both useful and probably very pedagogical. I mean, um, we, we are in a crisis. We, we, we need crisis solutions. So, um, so I'm curious to hear your take on that. There's a hand up there. Well, I, I suggested um, this uh, okay. chat. <laughs> so you um, can tell us in detail how you see it. Well, we, we, are, we are talking about fight. I've heard this word uh, several times today. Uh, and and um, President Macron said the same thing when COVID-19 started. He said, we are in a, in a fight, yeah, a we're war. in a war. And to make the war, uh, you, in many countries, there, there was a military service to prepare people, young people, to be able to respond to an attack, any military attack. 
And here, if we are in a fight, if we have combats to, at many levels, I mean, uh, in, in bureau or in the desk or, or on, the, on the field, uh, we need to, be, to prepare young people to this combat, uh, which means restoration services, conservation services, um, many type of service. Actually, um, uh, nowadays there is a, a civil service in France, and I know in many countries there is military service still running. Um, there could be another service beside this uh, military service. And so it would work locally and not uh, with um, uh, internationally. It could be organized internationally, but uh, it would avoid um, um, colonialism, uh, the, the, the colonial view to, um, I mean, to, to direct what should be done locally. This is my view. Yeah, I love the idea. Um, I guess you should run for the next election. Yeah. I like the, the idea, but maybe before uh, we need to, to sweep off all these uh, big useless projects to avoid that these uh, young students are put in, these, uh, in such projects. So maybe we are not ready for that. Which projects are you thinking about? Uh, ask uh, Vincent, the, the kind of project. But, b because you see, I, I think that uh, if we, well, currently a young student can by himself with the, in France, the, the Césure, and I know students, they, they do it by themselves, but it's not a kind of institutionalized. Uh, but if it comes from the institution, from state, then the, if there is a disagreement between the, the, the policy level and the science level, so the students could be sent in projects that the, the scientific community does not support. So. Of course. No, but I was... Uh, so to come back to seriously to the discussion, um, which was about what scientific institutions should do, because for the moment, scientific institutions don't do anything. I mean, people who want to volunteer for this or that or who want to speak up do. Uh, people who just want to do their business as usual do. Um, on the whole, I have the impression that there hasn't been much set up. But of course, I don't know everything that's going on. And, um, and I heard, for example, that in your institution, there was some reflection on uh, how to travel and how to, um, how to do science. So I'm interested in that. How do you see this problem? You just wanna... yeah. Well, we have, a, I mean, I think all institutions, all labs in France could have a working group on how, how to do science differently, given the situation. And it just happens that our new director, who, by the way, is a woman, uh, immediately um, launched this idea. And, and she has a regular meetings uh, with uh, the CEF and uh, real uh, profound reflections on, uh, I mean, how important it is to have uh, this type or another type uh, of papers, uh, high impact papers or not, how to, how to push students or not to write too many papers or not, but also whether you would like to give up a little bit uh, the long distance travels and what are the opportunities if you are not traveling so far, because at the CEF we travel all around the world and but also um, in helping us in, in in taking time for the whole community I mean for instance uh, I'm writing with other colleagues a, a charter of a chart in charge d'environnement of our campus, uh, of uh, how to use, uh, I mean, what to do about the garbage and so on. And uh, I think, uh, and, and whether we will have a, a, a common garden or not uh, to grow vegetables, I think all this is, um, is very useful as a community, uh, as a, almost 200 persons with, with young, young students with students to, to, to exchange differently also during different types of practices uh, than being in front of our screen and trying to, to finish our papers. And so I think this is useful and would be, should be established in all uh, labs in France. 
Well, well, this is a proposition, of course. Yes, I, I complete what uh, you just said. We have uh, commissions of uh, on sustainable uh, use within the institute, and and uh, for instance, uh, since our, my institute is managing the French uh, scientific fleet, there is a renewal of the fleet to for a cleaner, a cleaner, cleaner vessels, and um, but this is this of course takes uh, years, and uh, I think. Uh, when, so things at the individual level that, as you described, are, are one solution. Uh, but to, to um, complete what Alok said, I think, earlier, the way uh, research is assessed and the criteria used to assess research are very important. That is what will drive the changes at the institutional level. Because depending on the indicators of success, of scientific, what is scientific production, then there can really be a shift of, uh, for instance, spending more time into a dissemination, educative, educational, uh, uh, production of educational resources or training, um, I don't know, all the things where we can put science into action. Um, and uh, one more comment is that uh, for several years now, I I have uh, uh, trained my students more not as if they were going to, to follow a research a career, but I have, uh, I have favored the selection of students that I knew were going to engage in, not in research, but in, conserva in a science, uh, conservation-related science. And, uh, and so these people, one by one, several by several, in the end, they end up in uh, association, in NGOs, in um, parks, and that's a way to disseminate uh, our science. Ah, very interesting. Uh, Vincent raised his hand, and then Virginie um, back there. Yeah, so I just want to, to, to say that I'm personally very grateful to the institution uh, for, for which I'm working. The CNRS is just absolutely wonderful in offering stability and freedom so far. <laughs> it's not something that is granted. I mean, you, we, we should fight for that. But my understanding is that uh, some of us are not choosing that position, very comfortable position enough. So for some reasons, we, we, we tend to be shy or to, to think what, that we, we don't have the right to, to express more uh, ourselves. Although climate colleagues, cli climate scientists, and people from so social science sometimes are very uh, more courageous, I would say, in what they, they propose and say. So my, my view is that for some of us that are lucky enough to have freedom to speech uh, and to write and stability, it's almost a duty okay, to find new ways of commitment. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's going to um, follow the uh, Vincent proposal. I, I, I would first about um, the um, kind of things uh, institutions can or should do. Uh, I want to uh, notice that about our um, carbon in, uh, footprint, etc. Uh, science and especially in France, it's public science has to do. Uh, at least as much as all the other sectors of societies. So just to think deeply about our flight and, and etc. He's uh, just the feuille de route uh, of the France for the um, the degrowth de of uh, carbon emission. Uh, it's important, but it's not uh, that virtuous. It's just normal. We should cope our emission by half. Uh, in 10 years and uh, uh, obtain a neutrality carbon in uh, 2050. So we have a lot of things to do as scientists, but just like all the other uh, sectors of societies. Uh, regarding uh, our special um, position as scientists, I think it's quite a tricky issue to ask what should be the uh, position of the institution just 
because of what uh, Vincent mentioned, which is maybe the best thing the institution can do for uh, the place of science in society is just nothing, to let them do what they can, what they want, to uh, protect the freedom of research. And I think that the policy or political um, 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 target in science should always be taken with a lot of cautious, a lot of care. Um, and, and I think at the CNRS, for instance, uh, that one thing that is uh, uh, really uh, valued is the involvement of researchers in expertise or in uh, science policy uh, uh, interface, which is uh, good enough, I guess. So I just want to mention that maybe the best the institution could do is to uh, ensure our freedom of research, freedom of speech, freedom of positioning, which could become a harder and harder task for a research institution in a world that's becoming uh, quite um, complicated. Great point. Any more comments on that issue? Um, if there are not, uh, I'd, I'd be interested in the few minutes that we have left to move on to the funding issue. Um, somebody wrote on the chat that outbreaks cost $200 billion per year, and that giving just half of that money to science, to do surveillance and monitoring, etc., would save society uh, a lot. Okay, I guess it's probably true. Um, lots of sectors of society could do useful things with a hundred billion dollars, I guess, and uh, not only science, but um, how do you think funding is going to evolve in, in these years now? Um, you, you, you could argue that the COVID crisis is, is going to make funding in biodiversity and surveillance, etc., cetera, um, more available. You could argue that climate, climate crisis will have the same effect. Is this what you observe? Do you fear the opposite? Um, I'm curious what scientists think. Well, during the, the first uh, breakdown, we, we had this narrative saying that nothing will be like ever, uh, like, like, like before, because any money given afterwards will be mediated by why it should be given and what is the causes of giving, giving this money to this company and is it respectful and, and, and etc. I think we don't hear that anymore, right? It's, it's just going back to uh, cash flow to, to reload the economy just, just as before. So I'm curious about this shift from, okay, we, we had an opportunity to be much more uh, strict on to whom we give money and to do what and with kind of, uh, you know, uh, achievements to make sure that this money is wisely spent to a situation where I don't, I don't hear that anymore. So I think we've, we've missed something about, uh, about how we, we, we use fund to harmful projects in particular. Yep. Uh, about this funding, I mean, th there is also something about the, where the money is and uh, uh, what is the, the flow of budget. It was the COVID year, but it was also, uh, also the, the year when uh, individuals, single individuals, uh, uh, paid for their dream to, to fly to the moon. And I don't know what is the budget for that, but compared to the, the state budget, it's uh, incredible. So. I understand the countries, they have uh, multifunctional use of their money and it's limited. But on the same side, you have uh, one or two single individuals that have a tremendous uh, budget. So we should think uh, also on the flow to drive this money to the states and then they can g give it back to, to the science. There, there is a problem there. Uh, this is about the C word again. <laughs> Capitalism. Um, okay, so uh, we're reaching sort of the end of this uh, roundtable. Does anyone want to 
add a comment. Um, what do you think science will look like? What are your fears for the next period that is starting now? Or are we done? Okay. Can I say something? Go ahead. A short comment. Yeah, I think uh, the second or third question in Frank's list uh, about science communication and in general engaging outside universities. I think um, it is very important, and I think um, that would be that would what would bring the change. Uh, there has to be a better way of doing it. I think uh, I've been in this field for the last ten years or so, and I think um, the general attitude is: see, here are my findings of my research. Take it or leave it. I don't think or this is the end of the world and what should we do or let's do something but there's nothing beyond that i think uh, we have to find better more in more innovative more creative ways of communicating and uh, to use a bad word but it's a capitalist word so selling our results and how does one do that um, i think one way is to uh, put everything in terms of um, the currency that people understand or the policymakers understand, which is monetizing everything. Um, it doesn't mean that we have a utilitarian point of view towards biodiversity or the environment, but just for it to be more relevant and appealing to the common man, general public and policymakers. Um, Frank has been, for example, doing that with invasive species, but in general about biodiversity services, conservation impacts, um, eradication, removals, et cetera, so on and so forth. If we monetize things, if we let people know what are the, um, what is the economic value of uh, environmental impacts, then I think that would be one creative way of making it more appealing. And, more efforts need to go into how to make it more appealing and relevant for public. Thank you, Alec. I, I, I don't think uh, one minute before the end of a debate you can raise the monetizing issue uh, because this is really a very large discussion. Um, I, I, I just I agree, though, that what you uh, pointed out about communication is super important. Uh, I think. Uh, and, you know, I think we're in a new era um, where probably people are more interested in science and COVID has done this, uh, has, has done this job for us that it has shown that science is important. Um, and it's funny, from my perspective of science journalists and in science journalist associations, we, we, we get contacted by medias who say, uh, we, we don't have anybody who understands science in our newspaper. C can, you, can you point someone out? out to us who can help us. And I think there is a thirst of science out there, um, which, which has increased recently. And I guess the scientific community cannot be the only one to answer that thirst, of course, but, but it has a part to play and probably uh, uh, an important one. So, so maybe we can conclude on this. And uh, I want to thank you for your attention during these three days of conference. Um, there's been a lot of very interesting things said, and I think we can meditate on it and uh, keep these things with us for the period to come. Thank you to all, and uh, I wish you a nice afternoon. Thank you. Okay, and um, for Alonvi, I want to thank uh, all of you, for at least the ones who are left in this room, and uh, also thank you know, to this team that was very helpful and uh, very comprehensive on uh, scientists. <laughs> and also to the Marseillaise that really helped me to find a room at the last minute. So thank you. <laughs>